You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lawson. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael Lofton. Our third stream for the day. As promised, we're doing a review here of Taylor, Dr. Taylor Marshall's book, Infiltration. It's going to be a charitable review, and I'm going to be joined by River Run, one of our frequent contributors. In fact, he's uh, also known as an audiobook reader, lay Catholic, and uh, has provided some really good content for us on the channel so far. So he's going to be joining us. Then we also have our guest, Kevin Simmons. He lives in North Dakota where he works the church uh, theology or works with the church theology of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm misreading, lives in North Dakota where he works with the church's theology of private revelation. And also he is an oblate to the Benedictine monastery in Norcia, Italy as well. So I, th I thought that was pretty interesting when he mentioned that. I'm gonna bring them on here in just a moment. They're waiting backstage, but I wanted to briefly introduce them. As I said, Dr. Taylor Marshall's infiltration review coming up next. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Oh, Michael, I think we got your audio messed up. Uh oh. Oh, sort of. You able to hear me? Yeah, that's a little better. I'm not sure why. Everything looks good on my end. Are you hearing me well? It's it's good now. It's good now. It's good now? Okay. How are y'all doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, good to have you back on, River. Uh, Kevin, first time on. Nice to have you on. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And tell us a little bit more about yourself. You, you're a Benedictine oblate uh, for Norcia, Italy, the monastery over there. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Um, I... Knew the the prior the former prior there, Padre Cassiano Folsom, who's Benedictine monk of Saint Meinrad Arch Abbey, uh, Abbey in uh, Indiana, and he started a community of Benedictines over there in Norcia, Italy, on the year two thousand or so, give or take. Um, and uh, I think they lived in Rome prior to that. And so um, I've been known for many years, and I was like, I love the Benedictine monastic tradition, and love Latin, love Gregorian chant, and. Uh, I said I'd like to be an oblate. So mm -hmm. long story short, <laughs> here I am. I yeah, I'm I'm curious. Uh, what 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 kind of I, I just I know it's a little tangential. What what kind of uh, um, what do you have to do to become an oblate? Um, well, you first you have to kind of have you have to have an attachment to a particular monastery, mm -hmm. and uh, you you don't necessarily become like an attaché as they say in French, but. Uh, you have like an affiliation, you either like know the monks or there's something like you, you, you really enjoy the spirituality there at, at the particular monastery. And in my case, I just really loved Italy. Um, and I, I knew uh, some of the founding monks there for since 1997. Um, and I was like, I really like what you guys are doing here. So you, you make your intent known to the head of the monastery. In, that case, in this case, it was the prior, Father Cashin. And I, uh, you make your intent to become an oblate. And so for the first year, you become an oblate novice. So you're kind of on your training wheels. Uh, and then after that, you're eligible, if you want to continue, to be a full-fledged oblate, fully professed. So uh, I made my profession in, it was August 1st or 2nd of 2011 in, in Norcia. That was before the earthquake hit. Uh, and it destroyed that old basilica. Mm. I, I, I think I cried that day. <laughs> 
it yeah, was it was I remember hard. that. Yeah, that, that was very unfortunate. Yeah. Well, awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. What I want to do is dive into the review itself. And what I'm going to do is just kind of open up the floor for y'all to have a discussion. Um because I, I know y'all kind of have uh, an agenda or an order in which you're going to follow. So I'm just going to let y'all uh, take the floor, if you will. But River, I'll, I'll come to you first, and you just kind of take it wherever you want to go. All right, let's start with prayer. In nomine Patri, et Fili, Spiritui Sancti. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Pater nostem, qui es in celis, sanctificeta nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat volendos tua, sicut in celo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis udie, et emite nobis debita nostra, Sicut et nos temitibus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. Sed libera nos amalo. Domine exari orationem meam. Et clamo meus ante veniam. Oremus. O Almighty and everlasting God, Grant that our will be ever meekly subject unto thy will, and our heart ever honestly ready to serve thy majesty. Per Dominum nostrum Jesum Christum filium tuum, qui tecum vivet et regnat in unitati spiritus sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Sancta Maria, sede sapiense. Ora conobis. All right, we're going to do a preface against calumny. Um, with some readings from the catechism. The whole reason to do this, and the only real reason to do this, other than curiosity or frivolity, is to help correct other brothers in Christ. The primary vices we're dealing with when we deal with this book and we deal with topics like this, which is not to say that the book commits these things necessarily, but that it tends to them, are those social sins uh, that have to do with rash judgment, that have to do with detraction, and that have to do with calumny. So the sections from the uh, catechism I'm going to read are from roughly 240, uh, uh, 2,475 to 2,487. As Paul says, Christ's disciples have put on the new man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. By putting away falsehood, they are able to put away all malice, all guile, and insincerity and envy and all slander. Respect for the reputation of persons forbids every attitude and word likely to cause them unjust injury. He becomes guilty who? Of, uh, he becomes guilty of rash judgment who, even tacitly, assumes as true, without sufficient foundation, the moral fault of a neighbor. Of detraction who, without objectively valid reason, discloses another's faults and failings to persons who did not know them. Of calumny, who, by remarks contrary to the truth, harms the reputation of others and gives occasion for false judgments concerning them. To avoid rash judgment, everyone should be careful to interpret insofar as possible his neighbor's thoughts, words, and deeds in a favorable way. Every good Christian ought to be more ready to give a favorable interpretation to another's statement than to condemn it. But if he cannot do so, let him ask how the other understands it. And if the latter understands it badly, let the former correct him with love. If that does not suffice, let the Christian try all suitable ways to bring the other to a correct interpretation so that he may be saved. Detraction and calumny destroy the reputation and honor of one's neighbor. Honor is the social witness given to human dignity, and everyone enjoys a natural right to the honor of his name and reputation and to respect. Thus, detraction and calumny offend against the virtues of justice and charity. Further, boasting or bragging is an offense against truth. So is irony aimed at disparaging someone by maliciously carica caricaturing some aspect of his behavior. And finally, Every offense committed against justice and truth entails the duty of reparation. 
even if its author has been forgiven. When it is impossible publicly to make reparation for a wrong, it must be made secretly. I read this because one, uh, both Kevin and I have committed uh, to a set of ground rules about how we're going to proceed. To the best of our knowledge, everything we're going to say um, is true and truly intended and based on uh, foundations that we have with goodwill and in uh, the spirit of charity uh, uh, brought to our own attention, digested and prepared for preparation for all of you. We've both personally committed uh, to not engaging in personal attacks against Mr. Marshall or any of his associates or against anyone else in the course of doing this um, uh, in as far uh, as we can. Uh, we're not interested in a fight. We're interested in this material. Moreover, primarily the reason I'm interested in doing this material and the only reason I've ever been interested in working with uh, reactionary traditionalist material um, is to correct uh, problems just of calumny, problems of detraction, problems of rash judgment uh, that they foster uh, among the people of God. And it is a non-trivial problem. Um, Kevin, did you want to have any remarks uh, on, on this part? Um, nothing terribly much to add, except that, you know, this is a very contentious area. Um, you know, I've been kind of an old war horse, as it were. I've been through a lot of these sorts of discussions for the past uh, 19 or so years now. And you have to be very careful and very charitable. So that's why I think it's very good that we're choosing this tact, you know, um, and I, I like how you chose that prayer at the end, the English one there. You took it straight out of the Sunday after the Ascension, I noticed. That's why if you looked over, I saw I reached over, I had to grab my uh, monastic diary. I was like, wait, I know that prayer. <laughs> <laughs> this is why it helps to know the monastic tradition. <laughs> there you go. I pulled it straight out of the diurnal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, you caught me. Uh, <laughs> well, Michael, you did, did you? Own, you must have done your own translation, though. Uh, no, it's a, if you go to Divinum Officium, it has it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have the one from uh, the English Abbey there. Uh, Michael, did uh, you want to have any remarks yourself on uh, on on this part? Oh no, no. I I just I appreciate where y'all are coming from, and I I wholeheartedly support it. I think it's important to address a person's um, mm -hmm. arguments and their position rather than them personally. So I appreciate y'all are doing that and uh, setting the tone right here. So yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to do an introductory reading. Uh, yeah, this is, um, and I, I don't think, or very few people have actually read it, or at least it must be very few people have actually read it. I'm going to do a reading of the, um, the Pope Paul the VI uh, so-called smoke of Satan um, homily. Uh, and uh, it's important for a lot of reasons, and I'll tell you afterwards. So a uh, uh, selection from a summary of the ninth uh, homily, sorry, uh, let's see. Selection from a summary of the homily of Paul VI upon the anniversary of the coronation of His Holiness, delivered on the solemnity of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, Thursday, 29th, June, 1972. Referring to the situation of the church today, the Holy Father affirms that he has a sense that, quote, from some fissure, the smoke of Satan has entered the temple of God, end quote. There is doubt, incertitude, problematic, disquiet, dissatisfaction, confrontation. There is no longer trust of the church. They trust the first profane prophet who speaks in some journal or some social movement, and they run after him and ask him if he has the formula of true life. And we are not alert to the fact that we are already the owners and masters of the formula of true life. Doubt has entered our consciousness, and it has entered by windows that should have been open to the light. This state of uncertainty even holds sway in the church. There was the belief that after the council, there would be a day of sunshine for the history of the church. Instead, it is the arrival of a day of clouds, of tempest, of darkness, of research, of uncertainty. We preach ecumenism, but we constantly separate ourselves from others. We seek to dig, dig abysses instead of filling them in. For a life-giving and redeeming credo, 
How has this come about? The Pope entrusts one of his thoughts to those who are present, that there has been an, an intervention of an adverse power. Its name is the devil, this mysterious being that the letter of St. Peter, Peter also alludes to. So many times, furthermore, in the gospel on the lips of Christ himself, the mention of this enemy of men returns. The Holy Father observes, quote, we believe in something that is preternatural, that has come into the world precisely to disturb, to suffocate the fruits of the ecumenical council, to impede the church from breaking into the hymn of joy at having renewed in fullness its awareness of itself. Precisely for this reason, we should wish to be able, in this moment more than ever, to exercise the function God assigned to Peter to strengthen the faith of the brothers. We should wish to communicate to you this charism of certitude that the Lord gives to him who represents him through unworth though unworthily on this earth. Faith gives us certitude, security, when it is based upon the word of God accepted and consented to with our very own reason and with our very own human spirit. Whoever believes with simplicity and humility, sense that he is on the good road, that he has an interior testimony that strengthens him in the difficult conquest of truth. Okay. Uh, other than the fact that this reading is something that uh, we all as Catholics ought to be able to agree on, um, one thing I wanted to talk about, and this is by way of introduction to how Marshall operates. He has a whole chapter on the smoke of Satan. Most uh, uh, reactionary traditionalists uh, and I'm sorry that I have to use the term, uh, have um, the smoke of Satan as a, as a meme, as a catchphrase. And um, the smoke of Satan, uh, he characterizes pretty particularly, uh, he characterizes it as uh, the running after of, what did he say? Um, uh, he characterizes it as doubt, uh, incertitude, uh, problematic, disquiet, dissatisfaction, uh, confrontation. And he says that uh, people, uh, they run after uh, a prophet, so-called, who speaks in some journal or some social movement and ask him if he has the formula of true, not, true life. That is to say, he's talking about public detractors, public malefactors um, who uh, uh, introduce doubt into people who should otherwise be faithful. Uh, and uh, uh, he also talks about this failure in terms of a, a failure of true ecumenism. He talks about it uh, in terms of a failure of true renewal out of the council. Um, he talks about it as a, a failure of faith. Um, this is not, in fact, uh, just exactly how Mr. Marshall talks about it. Mr. Marshall spends all of chapter one talking about the smoke of Satan in scripture. Uh, he talks about um, the devil in general. Uh, he sets it up as a preface for what he's going to call infiltration. Uh, but the smoke of Satan uh, for Paul VI is none of these things. The smoke of Satan is the very public uh, failures of Catholics and non-Catholics that impede the work of the church. Uh, Kevin, did you want to talk at all on this on this meme on this topic? Yeah, a little bit. I'm I'm familiar with this because uh, this is one of the appendix items in my book, Pope Leo the Thirteenth and the Prayer to Saint Michael. Um, you know, I I like the way you present it and talking about it within the context of what this is. But uh, I think it's first good to note uh, a peculiarity or particularity, pardon me, of this text. This is actually not the full homily. The Vatican never released it. Um, the, the, the English itself is, an English, is a translation from the Italian that was published in the official Insegnamenti di Paolo VI collection. Uh, I think it was volume 10, 9 or 10. I have the book in my closet here. but um, the, And it was, it was only printed in excerpts. And there's like editorial paraphrases in between. So we don't actually have the full context of like in the Pope's own words. I don't know why the Holy See chose that path. So I think it's important for us first to note that because that's an important key. Um, 
I know I've, I've, I've read Infiltration. I read it two years ago when it first came out, and I've been going through it again in preparation for tonight. Um, you know, I know Marshall does talk about in the context of, of smoke and how it has some liturgical connotations in scriptures. And it's actually a fact that uh, Paul VI's uh, liturgical uh, coordinator, I can't remember his, uh, his official title, but the guy that helped Paul VI coordinate the liturgy, uh, Virgilio Cardinal Noah, uh, they called I can't believe I'm going to say this. They called him the Prince of Prim uh, because he was very proper, you know, if everything had to be done by the book and, you know, he wore things. And um, that was kind of how people called him at the Vatican and in, uh, in Vatican circles. But he actually gave an interview shortly before he died uh, to an Italian publication called Il Petrus, and in which he expressly stated Paul VI's remark here was actually about the liturgical abuses. And so that was kind of a little bit of a little revelation there because this is the guy that worked closely liturgically with Paul VI and, you know, knew the Holy Father fairly well. Um, so I, I thought that was an interesting parallel, but at the same time, uh, you know, not everybody agrees that that's an exclusive uh, way to be looking at it. But certainly when we look at the things like the liturgical abuses going on at the time, it fits how you're presenting this within the context of Paul the Sixth remarks about people doing their own thing essentially and not developing that attitude of synthetical ecclesia, think to think with the church. And so uh, Paul the Sixth was very aware of what was going on with, with the liturgical abuses. So I think there's some room there to say that liturgical abuses are certainly a part of that, but the larger context is presented here certainly indicates that there's a lot of other stuff going on. So those are just some of the thoughts I wanted to share initially here. And I want to I want it to be obvious, and it should be obvious from everything you can read of Paul the Sixth, and you should read the encyclicals and letters and homilies of Paul the Sixth. It should be obvious that most of the things Paul the Sixth talk of, talk of, talks about are not court intrigue, are not talk about private plots behind his back. Um, he primarily talks about things that you can see publicly. Um, even even liturgical abuses are public abuses. Mm -hmm. um, even um, in the church, he, he talks about social movements. What are social? There's plenty of social movements in the church. There's a weird introduction of um, you know secular, uh, even you know heavily leftist um, ideas through academia into the church. That's public. There's um, you know, weird uh, leaders, that's public. Uh, even, uh, I think by this point, you've already got problems with Lefebvre, um, who Paul gave plenty of chances. That's public. All of that's public. None of that is a secret plot. And Paul, to my knowledge, uh, almost never, if ever, talks about court intrigue, secret plots, things hidden behind his back. Um, I can think of no case, he might somewhere, but that's never his concern. Um, and uh, that you, you'd think it was the opposite uh, when people cover this text, and it isn't. The, the, the case, in fact, is that our problems are problems. You can see uh, the devil acts in broad daylight for us. Uh, Michael, did you want to talk about this section at all? No, no nothing offhand. Okay. Let's see. If I may add one thing real quick while we're you know, getting ready to transition. Um, the story about the smoke of Satan in, in Taylor Marshall's book, um, the practical effect of it, at least on me as a reader um, and someone who's very conversationally fluent in these topics because I've read about them for almost as long as I've been a Catholic, you know, it sets a tone and it's very sensational smoke of Satan, you know, entering the church and, you know, it, it, it sets a certain tone. And I think if I remember correctly, um, yeah, I'm not going to find it now, but the, um, the general tone that it kind of sets, I think is a little, with all, and with all due respect, I think it's very disturbing because uh, when I first went through the book, at the bottom of, I have a first edition first print, by the way, because I, I was one of the first people to get a copy right when it came out. I have this note here that I made in pencil, and I said, is somehow the devil going to supplant Peter? Gates of hell, dot, 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 question mark. Yeah, 
Um, After reading these, that's yeah. kind of the thought I had. I'm like, what about the gates of hell? You know, like not prevailing. Yeah, the the theme of the sub the, the the church being supplanted, the church being overcome, the church being infiltrated, the church being infected. That we're going to see that over and over again. And we're not in the review proper, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do appreciate on one level. Um, and I, I want to say, especially when I go back uh, into the personal life of Marshall, and I, I, I today to try to evoke as much charity for the man as possible, I, I, I went and watched uh, his coming home interview with Grodi, and um, you know uh, he was a he he at the time he was an earnest man who had converted from being an Episcopalian priest. Uh, he clearly had a fire for ministry. He clearly had a love for what he was doing. Uh, he was just launching into uh, being the head of a, a Catholic university that he had ho really hoped would take off. And uh, you could see it. And even even now, I mean, in chapter one, it's um, I, I really appreciate the theological excursus on the smoke of Satan in scripture. I really appreciate that in a certain way as a theme. Um, and I would love to hear it in a homily or I would love to see it as part of a devotional. Uh, on the other hand, it's a theme he he there's there's no triumph of the church in his uh, there's you, you would think the church has no power to resist Satan in his excursus. You would think that the church is uh, holy um, and that the laity and that the people of God are wholly subject to the to the action of Satan. Uh, and, and moreover, it, it's it's a pattern that that goes through the book. Um, but we'll, we'll we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so I wanted to move on to who Taylor Marshall is. If you don't know, I'm sure you all know who Taylor Marshall is, but I, I, I'm wanting to make sure that everybody who comes to this knows what we're talking about. So, to, you know, we, we could talk, you know, charitably about the man. Taylor Marshall uh, is an American Catholic YouTube commentator. He's a writer. He's a former academic uh, known for his advocacy for traditionalist Catholicism. Uh, he's the author of multiple books other than infiltration. He graduated from Texas A&M in 99 with a degree in philosophy. He studied then at Westminster Theological Seminary uh, and uh, 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 Nadosh House. Um, he was ordained a priest of the Episcopal Church uh, in 2006, shortly after uh, he and his wife converted to Catholicism. Uh, he, in 2011, he earned a PhD in philosophy at the University of Dallas studying Thomas Aquinas, if I recall. Uh, in the early 2010s, he served as a chancellor of now defunct College of St. John Fisher and Thomas More. Uh, prior to this uh, administrative work, he was a professor of philosophy. Uh, he's also served as assistant director of the Archdiocese of Washington's Catholic Information Center. Uh, he's a founder of a new St. Thomas Institute, an online Catholic theology program, uh, the Troops of St. George, all sorts of things. Uh, he's published books in theology, philosophy, historical fiction. He's he's an experienced man. Uh, he's also uh, he was also involved uh, uh, in 2020 politics. Uh, he got uh, uh, attention from Donald Trump. Uh, he was retweeted. All sorts of things. Now infiltration, and I'm going to give you, I, and I, I because I, I and this was important because when I looked at the reviews. Um, many of the reviewers uh, didn't really give Taylor uh, much time to to breathe his own description of what his book is doing. So I'm gonna I'll let you I'll let him tell you what his book is. Okay, this is his own promotional material. It took nearly two millennia for the enemies of Christ, of the Catholic Church to realize they could not successfully attack the Church from the outside. Indeed, countless nemeses from Nero to Napoleon succeeded only in creating sympathy and martyrs for our Catholic faith. That all changed in the mid 19th century when clandestine societies populated by modernists and Marxists hatched a plan to subvert the Catholic church from within. Their goal, to change her doctrine, her liturgy and her mission. In this captivating and carefully documented book, Dr. Taylor Marshall pulls back the curtain on their nefarious plan, showing how these enemies of Christ strategically infiltrated the seminaries, then the priesthood, then the episcopacy, and eventually the cardinal electors, all with the eventual goal of electing one of them as their own, as Pope. 
you'll come to see that the seemingly endless scandals plaguing the church are not the result, as so many think, of cultural changes or of Vatican II, but rather the natural consequences of an orchestrated demonic plot to destroy the church. In these gripping pages, you'll discover as follows. How popes of the 1800s discovered a plot to infiltrate the church. How theologians suspected of being modernists became Vatican power brokers. How modifications on Catholic canon law enabled predator priests like Theodore McCarrick to stay in positions of power. How Our Lady of La Salette gave a prophetic warning of the plot to infiltrate the church. How the chief architect of liturgical reforms was discovered to be a Freemason. Archbishop Fulton Sheen's role in exposing the communist infiltration of the priesthood. How the confusing history of the third secret of Fatima relates to the infiltration of the Catholic Church. That Pope Paul VI explained that Vatican II was not infallible. How Pope Paul VI revoked the voting rights of cardinals over 80, thus guaranteeing that all voting cardinals were appointed by him. How the criteria for sainthood shifted from a person's historical acts to his personal beliefs. And the complex roots of the St. Gallen Mafia and how they plotted to modify Catholic doctrine and elect Pope Francis. And that's his own description, okay? I don't want anybody to say I, I misrepresented anything at any point. Why is infiltration important? Now, infiltration is important for a lot of reasons. I, I'll, give you some, I'll give you some facts, um, uh, and then so we can sort of talk about it in a more free-floating free way. Infiltration right now is ranked on Amazon as the number 35 best-selling book on Catholicism. And that's just behind Thomas Merton's The Seven Story Mountain. And it's ahead of both Scott Hahn. It's ahead of Scott Hahn's classic Rome Sweet Home. It's ahead of Ralph Martin's newer A Church in Crisis. And to our shame, it's ahead of Augustine's Confessions as well. Uh, it's number two in Christian institutions and organizations. It's number 14 in history of religions. It's number 14 in general history of religion. And overall, it's ranked 9,283. And keep in mind that Amazon sells uh, 45.5 million books. Uh, we don't know how many he sold, but he's got, and I granted he had a marketing cam campaign to generate a lot of these, but he's got 3,000 479 ratings on Amazon, which is much higher than most most books, far higher, even higher than many a big name best selling books. And um, uh, you, like you, you have to understand that this is not a trivial, no nothing, you never heard of it book. I mean, when it was released, it was number it was number one best selling book on Catholicism. It's this is not you know not nothing. Um, on top of that, even outside of sort of its 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 immediate relevance, you know, if you want to say oh, it's two three years ago, um, it serves as a digest of what most reactionary traditionalists talk about over and over. You can think of it as a big compilation of traditionalist memes, of traditionalist talking points. Every um, when, when I came into the church. I came in through and around a lot of traditionalism. And I mean, when I picked up Taylor Marshall's book, it was the same thing I'd been hearing for 10 years. Uh, it was the same. It wasn't anything new to me. Why? Because this is what traditionalists have been talking about over and over since the 70s, since the 80s, since the 90s. Um, and so if you want to deal with those problems, it's perfectly good to get Taylor Marshall's book uh, and to look at it and to look at difficulties so as you might be better prepared to deal with the kinds of claims and arguments you're going to be dealing with um, in traditionalist circles. Also, one thing that's a big deal with this book, in, in my opinion, uh, and I'm not, I don't want to impute this to Marshall himself. Maybe Marshall has perfectly good will. Uh, you know, maybe he's ignorant, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's not really what he's trying to do. Um, but the book itself either displays, at least apparently, or occasions in its readers a number of vices that are pretty typical 
for reactionaries. So, I mean, first of all, I mean, the, the primary one is uh, a kind of skepticism, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, uh, but it's, it's a kind of, sometimes you call it a hermeneutic of suspicion, uh, a kind of uh, epistemic skepticism. But basically, there's, there's a primary orientation towards the truth and to the world, which holds that we can't really trust what we're looking at from the church or maybe from anybody. Uh, and so we need to uh, see, you know, get the facts ourselves and see for ourselves and discover the, the real thing that's going on. Ed Fazer sometimes calls this um, uh, a, a, con a contemporary Gnosticism. The, and, uh, and Father Ripperger talks about this as well, if you listen to his, his videos on traditionalist biases. That's a tendency towards Gnosticism. And what's this going to be? It's going to be, we have the secret. We have the secret real knowledge of what's going on, of how to be really saved, of how to go to the right liturgy, of how to whatever you want. And the the whatever the public voices or the mainstream sources or whatever you want, these aren't real. And uh, so you've got to come on this journey with us to figure it out. You've got so you got that problem. Uh, you've got problems with what we started with, which is rash judgment, detraction, and calumny. So the book is full of sometimes really gross claims about people that um, are thrown out as if that's just what you talk about. Um, I'll talk about it later, but um, he throws out, for instance, the accusation that uh, Pope Paul VI uh, had a secret uh, homosexual relationship for a long time. He doesn't accuse Paul VI of it, which good, but he throws it out there like it was nothing. Uh, like it didn't, like that's just something you just talk about. And it, not only that, but it had no reason to be thrown out. Uh, it was just there to pile on Paul VI. That's a terrible vice. And it's it's contrary uh, to charity. It's contrary to justice. And it's, it's, it's an attack on the reputation of the dead uh, and is a grave sin. Um, and you, 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 but, but you'll see all these things. I mean, you, you'll see people linked casually to murder You'll see people linked casually to, um, uh, at the very least, uh, passive deception of all of the faithful. Uh, you'll see people linked to at least the tacit approval of um, uh, fostering the sin of all of the faithful uh, and the non-faithful alike. These are, at the very least, pretty grave detraction, if not calumny. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, you'll also see fast and loose with the facts. So even when uh, we're going to be looking at things for the facts, often sometimes we'll go from some evidence, maybe some witnesses, maybe a witness of a witness, to a straight conclusion that it happened. Or you'll often see speculation, but it won't be actual it won't be stated as speculation. It'll be stated as if it was just the case, as if you look at this, like there'll be, basically it'll be, we'll present some things, usually some scandalous material. Uh, then where the inference would be, we say nothing. And then we make the conclusion. So uh, liturgy, all weird. Uh, uh, Bunini, uh, uh, possibly, uh, for, for instance, Bunini, uh, plausibly, possibly, maybe, definitely is a Freemason dot, dot, dot. Therefore, the reform of the liturgy is a, a Freemasonic infiltration and the mass is a Freemasonic product. The, the leap, the dot, dot, dot is a speculation. It's a lot of steps that aren't put forward. Uh, and when the, what they put in dot, dot, dot is basically just look at it. It's obvious. Don't you see it? If you don't see it, you're an idiot. Uh, or you're, you're, you must be for Satan. Or you, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, just trust me, bro. You know, come on, you know, just look at it. Well, I do just look at it. And when I actually look at it and when you dig any amount, the obviousness of it uh, usually ain't. And so if that's the case, first of all, as if from a scholarly perspective, you're at least obliged to in that dot, dot, dot say, I speculate or I think it's plausible or, you know, it, you know, maybe it's the case that blah, blah, blah. And then you could even suggest here's a, here's some room for further research. 
uh, you know, so that we can substantiate this a little better. And if that's true, then the 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 mass might be considered a Freemasonic product and blah blah blah. But you have to do that dot 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 step, and you have to let people know that they're that they aren't looking at facts that they aren't looking at things that should just be obvious but rather that they're looking at speculative conclusions stated as if they were facts and that happens all the time it's a vice it's a sin against truth it's a sin against reason uh it's a problem and it's not trivial it's grave because it can mislead people on their salvation that's why it's grave because it can lead you into lies and illusions that's why it's grave because it's contrary to the words of our Savior, it's contrary to the words of Paul, it's contrary to the words of the Apostle, it's contrary to the word of the Fathers. That's not how we operate. Um, and there's other vices too, and we'll get to them as we go. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this introductory too much longer, but uh, Kevin, did you want to talk about this a little bit? Um, yes. Um, you know, I, I think you contextualized it rather well, the specific issue there with, um, you know, I wrote a review that was published last year in a British publication called Mass of Ages. It was on Taylor Marshall's infiltration. And I have to be very brutal in, in it's public knowledge anyway. Um, my problem with infiltration wasn't so much always and everywhere in every part of the book that some of the things that he said wasn't true. My problem with him was he was incredibly sloppy with how he handled the, the 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 research and how he wrote about things and i said this is public knowledge I and mean, i said this publicly it's not a you know it's not a surprise um so for instance you said the dot 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 with respect to bonini that where the dot 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 is that's where marshall could have done better research but instead um of actually following up on footnotes and sources that he did have uh or even word of mouth whatever he put things in, in the book in such a way where it's like, this is the problem that we have that you presented with how things look, you know, just the optics of it. Yeah, that's uh, that's a big issue. It's the it's it's it'll be even if he's on to something. And there's plenty of things where I, I you know, yeah. some of these some of these trad things are go, oh yeah, that's at least some kind of well, problem. Well, for instance, to, uh, put Bonini aside for a moment because I I do believe Bonini was working with the Freemasons. There's there's little doubt about that in my mind based upon my own research and what I've uncovered through a witness who actually had eyes on the documents, uh, or some of the documents anyway. But um, take what he says about the Sant, what Taylor Marshall says about the Sant Gallen Mafia. Um, that news came out in uh, the year 2015, around the time of Pope Francis's uh, apostolic visit to the United States in September of 2015. I think that was Cardinal Daniels that revealed the existence of the group and was talking about stuff. I remember that was big news. Um, and that was kind of like the, oh my goodness, what's going on? Did it, was this going? But then when it got caught up with McCarrick, you know, Marshall gives you all kinds of circumstantial evidence in, in, in his book that, you know, it puts um, uh, McCarrick on scene in St. Gallen proper there, uh, the, the, the little town. And there is some interesting history of, of, of St. Gallen in connection to communism. So we have circumstantial evidence, but no real original research. And that was kind of my problem when I was reading this. I was like, you're making me want to know more. And I feel like I'm being led on and gypped even. Um, I speak a little plainly. I don't mean to be uncharitable in my, in my plainness, but that's kind of how it left, made, left me feel because I do appreciate good, solid, original research. And so as I read and I read, I was getting a better picture for what this book actually is and what Marshall was doing. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later, but these are just some of the examples. You know, there wasn't much original research there's only really one or two things that I can remember off the top of my head that I thought were rather novel ideas. Um, when we get into the Alta Vendita, uh, that's uh, one of those areas I'll point out. But yeah, I mean, it, it's that dot, 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 that it's like, what's going on here? It, it's a lot of stuff strung together, but it's circumstantial. And the question is, why? I have a theory on that. Maybe we'll get to it later. You know, I <clears throat> I have a quick question. I want to know if y'all uh, notice this as well, but it seems like there are points where Dr. Marshall would put something in quotation, but not get it, give any references. 
and he would make claims that clearly aren't his own, um, but aren't well-known facts. So they would need to be given references. And I, and I didn't see that. Case in point is the section where he's discussing um, the issue with Our Lady of La Salette. And I believe it was Pope uh, Pius X or XII, one, one of those that he was quoting. And he quotes him in Italian as saying, you know, our saint, referring to... La Nostra uh, Santa. Yeah, exactly. And, and, he, and he puts that in quotes, and he's referring to a story or an event that allegedly happened with this pope, but I don't see any references there. And so no. is this something that y'all encountered a lot whenever y'all did your review, your, your reading through Dr. Marshall's material? On, on my yeah. end... Um, so I, I had a philosophy background like Taylor Marshall. So I was actually, uh, and I don't, and this is kind of why I love to have Kevin here because Kevin has focused very on, on very detailed scholarly issues. And I have, uh, I have a, a, a bigger philosophical approach and in philosophy, um, you know, when you do papers or you do research, not that you don't need good citations, but you know, careful documentation of this guy said this when he said this and here's exactly what he said it and primary source work and you can kind of play a little you know you can read a guy and you know kind of read oh maybe it means this maybe it means this. so i was sympathetic to that problem in taylor it's so for me it wasn't so much and i know a lot of reviewers um would get frustrated with uh, you know a lot of the more positive reviewers would get frustrated with negative reviews on Taylor, and they would the one characterized this as, oh, the book's not academic enough. Um, you know, it doesn't have all, it doesn't cross all its T's, dot all its I's. And of course, I think that academic work is important. But you want to, you might say, oh, Taylor, he's doing something more loose, something more popular, but it's still good. You could, you could flesh it out if you wanted. You could get precise if you wanted. Uh, so just stick to the idea, stick to the point. Well, but for me. First of all, I'm not sure that you could even substantiate any of it at this point, uh, not, not, but at least what he needs to substantiate. But moreover, like the real issue is that the is that the 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 connections don't work. Like in, in every basically in every important point, every transition point in in the narrative that would get you from A to B, there's no source, there's no justification, there's a movement. Uh, it's usually fallacious, and uh, it 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 doesn't. It gives me no reason to believe it, even on the. And Kevin's going to talk about this. And it's so frustrating, even on the stuff like some of the Bunini stuff. I thought was clearly a bunch of um, nonsense. I thought, oh, this is Dick Tracy stuff, and it might really be substantial. But Taylor didn't bother. Didn't bother. Didn't bother don't care. Didn't bother. Not going to do it. Not going to deal with it. Not going to put it out because I need that. If you're going to give me something really implausible that really looks speculative, that really looks like a story, I'm going to need, come on, like, come on, like, do the work. Like, let me believe that maybe possibly you thought about something that could be real. And he doesn't do it. And on top of that, as um, as a as a philosophical mind, I need the re I need the reasoning to be tight. Are you giving me, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, are you giving me a causal story? Are you giving me just a narrative and I got to fill in the causation? Are you giving me, um, you know, are you giving me a court trial thing where there's a thing and I need to demonstrate that there's at least no reasonable doubt? Look, what are you doing? And I never know what he does. And uh, I, I can interpret it four or five different ways and I can pick one that's favorable. Um, and that's that's a big issue for me, not simply the sourcing, although the sourcing is terrible. Um, you know, Kevin, can you also comment there on, on my question? Was this something that you encountered? All throughout the book. Mm -hmm. All throughout the book. Um, I don't know if this would be the place actually to mention it, but I can talk about two things in particular. Um, but first I want to open up. I, I want to say that I'm not the only one who noticed it. There is a gentleman who is, he's a study of a contest named Mario Dirks, and he runs the website Novus Ordo Watch. And he had a two-part podcast in which he talked about Marshall uh, last year, I believe it was. And he showed you exactly this very point. And I must say, I disagree with him wholeheartedly on study of the contism, but he did a very nice job 
footnoting himself and telling you exactly where the like what the page was, what was said, why this is probably he did a, he he backed himself up exactly what River is saying. You know, uh, he did the work and he did it very admirably. I must say. Also um, on on this matter, I wanted to say briefly for the audience because I forgot to say at the beginning, I've got it. it I it's at least it, by the time we're all done, who knows how long it'll be. Uh, I'm I've got prepped. Uh, at least a 15 page bibliography of everything I looked at of everything Ke that Kevin sent me of some things that Kevin looked at. I got a huge bibliography that'll be appended to this episode and you all can go look for yourself at the reviews of this book. You all can go look at sources on the various things we talk about. You, I, uh, please like, this isn't just me coming on to have a rant and tell you this is good and it's really, and I just have a problem. You can let's look at it. Just look at it for yourself. Read everything I read and see if you don't come to the same problems. That's yeah. that's the real issue. Yeah, some, someone in the chat called it River Rant. I thought I, I laughed. I thought it was kind of funny. But yeah, <laughs> we, we, one of the, I'll give two examples. One is one is like I mean, there's an all total objectivity. The other one, actually, admittedly, is personal. Uh, in chapter nine of Marshall's book, Communist Infiltration of the Priesthood, he gives. Um, We'll get. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but he gives. He talks a little bit about Bella Dodd, the famous communist lawyer who reverted to the to the Catholicism of her youth, and she she had claimed that there were four cardinals that were working for the Vatican. She said this to Dietrich and Alice von Hildebrand back uh, around between sixty five and sixty seven, shortly before her own death in the late sixties. Well, Marshall, uh, pages eighty eight to eighty nine of this first edition of the book. Again, I have to be specific about when I say first edition because I don't know how many other things are out there. So I want to be specific citing my own source. He gives the list of these cardinals, but there's no footnote to tell you where he got this list. Well, I ha when I saw this, I knew exactly where he got that list from because I'd seen it years before. It's from an Italian website. Um, or at least that's the, and they actually went back and did the work. They went to, I think, the Annuario Pontificio and they, they did this. And when you look at the, when you compare what this person says on, on his website, and then you see this list, it's word, name by name, word for word. And it, it's like, but the, he doesn't, it makes, Marshall makes it look like he did this work himself. So I, I don't want to accuse, you know, him of anything, but it sounds like, He's taking somebody else's work and appropriating it as his own. Is that correct? That's the impression. I like to mm -hmm. I like to put explain it as Marshall just played fast and loose, and mm -hmm. I think part of it was because I had heard uh, from a friend who 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 heard the actual podcast from Marshall say, and this person is a priest, say that Marshall wrote this book in either six weeks or six months. So that tells me, depending upon which one it is, that kind of is an indicator to me personally of the kind of editing that went into this. And we know that Dr. Jeff Miris, one of the founders of Christendom College, he was given, a, a, I think, an advanced reader's copy, and he contacted Sophia Institute Press, the publisher, and said to them, you can't publish this as it is. It's so full of holes. I'm paraphrasing. But he's, he's so full of holes, like, this is not good. Well, they published it anyway. Then the second thing I want to point out, and this this is the personal one, and I might get flayed alive for this, mm -hmm. um, but if you go to chapter five of Marshall's book, pages 38 to 40, again in this first edition, first print, uh, I am going to make a I am going to make a statement here. Mm -hmm. um, Marshall. Uh, again, played fast and loose with his sources, and he actually appropriated uh, an int my intellectual property. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I state this. Um, in my book, chapter five of, of my book, Pope Leo XIII and the Prayer to St. Michael, I am the one who made an observation between an Italian priest, Padre Domenico Pescinino, with the... Uh, German mystic, now blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. I am the only one who made this observation, this particular observation. Marshall knows about this book because right on pages 38 through 39, he cites, one of the times he does cite, my book. And it's the second edition, which is the one we're talking about. 
he appropriated my idea of uh, my intellectual property without duly sourcing where he got it from of the association between Anne Catherine Emmerich and um, and this this uh, Italian priest Padre Domenico Pasolino. And I, I when I read this, I, I was like, "Oh my goodness! Like, what did I just read?" I, I'm like, uh, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what is going on here? But I want to be clear. My erstwhile, my my criticisms overall are not rooted in this particular thing. This is just one example among many that can be found within the book. But I bring it up because I am the guy. And not only did Marshall appropriate it, he then turns around and indirectly responds to my point and says, quote, um, Emmerich, who predates Pescianino by a century, refers specifically to the unchaining of Satan for 50 or 60 years. If, however, Pescianino was ignorant of Emmerich, we have a providential agreement of two separate sources, namely that Satan will be loose for the last 50 or 60 years of the 20th century. That's indirectly a response to the point that I make in my book. And it, I, I, it's just... And above it, he, he, it's the same. It's the same stuff. And uh, I actually sought legal counsel uh, to see if this was like what I thought it might have been. And uh, I, I was told, in fact, that yes, this was infringing upon my intellectual property. I, I attempted privately to contact Taylor Marshall and to say to him, "Could you please, to, privately, mind you, I, I wasn't making this public. I tried privately to contact him." and say, hey, stuff happens. I get it, you know, like I, I did it accidentally once. I, I gave a paper of mine to a friend to, to, to him to review and he, uh, he edited it, but told he forgot to tell me that it was a quote from Pope Benedict mm -hmm. and it went to print. And, I, and when I realized the error, I was like, oh my goodness. So it was an honest mistake, I, it was ignorant. But so I, I get it, stuff happens, right? And I made a statement on my website, you know, it was all good. But um, I tried to contact him privately and he never responded. One of the priests that was edited, Padre Donna Christen Christensen, he's a fellow oblate to Norcha. And I, I contacted him and I said, would you talk to Marshall and tell him, please call me? Because he's not responding to my emails, texts or phone or calls. Well, it, it never happened. And I felt bad. I'm like, Dr. Marshall, this kind of needs to be fixed. I would just be happy with a simple footnote, you know, instead of, that says, my bad, I'm sorry, I overlooked it. Over, done with. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's move on with our lives. Um, so, yeah, it was very, uh, very noteworthy. And that was an original observation that I made. And I, I'm one of the people that he took advantage of in that regard. And I'm, I, I say this with no malice. You know, I... I I think I think Marshall does some good, and I don't I don't wish him evil. But this was one of the things. So this this is important to know. I won't drag it out. I'll leave it there. <laughs> All right. Um. And let's let's bring it back in. So the uh, before we move out of this section, um, and you know, back on the the issue of vices, uh, I know that, and this isn't Marshall directly to my knowledge. Uh, I know that. Just on, just in the lead up to this, it's what I'm talking about. With respect of calumny, with respect of detraction, with respect of rash judgment, which are sins. I know that on Twitter, I know that in private, I know that in email, uh, wherever you want, that um, uh, me and Michael and Kevin have experienced already the expression of uh, of the of these vices, and it's it's not wrong. I mean, the people really do have a sinful attachment to these these narratives, um, e or even if they're facts, they have a sinful attachment to these facts. And if anybody, you know, if you want to talk about it, talk about it because it's it's not trivial and it happens everywhere. And I've seen it in my parish and you know, among other faithful. Kevin, I mean, you saw some stuff about this. With respect to specifically, you, you like, said uh, the, on Twitter, you were saying about. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, last night, just just like last night, when um when uh, Mr. Lofton had 
you know, announced that this was kind of that this podcast was taking place, you know, he was uh, some people made some very negative comments. One of what one of whom I happen to know, I corresponded with him via email and I was invited to be on his show. Um, I can say it publicly because Twitter is public knowledge, but I don't remember his name, but it's the gentleman that runs that the website restoring the faith RTF. He has a YouTube channel. Um, and you know that they, he just, he accused Mr. Lofton of having a, an autistic fixation upon Taylor Marshall and Eric Sammons of crisis magazine, the editor in chief was chiming in and saying stuff too. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, where is the love people? Where is the charity? You know, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, Marshall's book is, if I may use this expression, it's a cash cow. And I think there's some conflict of interests here. You know, Mr. Sammons, for instance, he's the editor in chief of Crisis Public Magazine, which used to be a hard copy, but hard copy, but now it's online. And Sophia Institute owns it. Marshall's publisher is Sophia Institute Press. So they're under the general same you know, umbrella of, of companies. So I, I get that he may want to defend his guy, but I'm like, are you weighing the actual stories or are you just, what's, what are you doing here? You know, and, uh, uh, and, very I, and I don't want to dwell, we, we need to get into the substance of you, but Michael, you said you've been dealing with stuff too. Is that right? <laughs> all day long. <laughs> uh, and and we're, we're not, and I'm not saying it's just a complain or whatever, but I mean, like, why? Like, why is it, you know, if you're right, you're right. Like, I, you know, I have, I have academic disputes with people. I don't sick a bunch of people after yeah, and complain. You know, I, I'm sure it's different for different people. You, you can't say it's the, the same reason for everyone. But I think in general, I think what it is, is when you start addressing some of these issues, you're taking away people's security blanket. It, yeah, this is something. Yeah. This is something that some people have in their life to try to process and, and deal with the crisis in the Catholic Church, and I completely understand because, look, we're we're all trying to deal with the crisis in the church. But the problem is, some people adopt certain uh, positions that they believe is comforting to them, that helps them make sense of the crisis, but actually ends up harming them elsewhere and is inconsistent elsewhere. And so what I'm trying to do is show the inconsistency with some of it. And some people, first of all, jump to conclusions and don't know that I'm doing that. And they just think I'm a liberal. Yeah. Um, and then others who maybe don't jump to a conclusion on that just still don't understand how this might be inconsistent. And that's because they don't engage Eastern Orthodoxy very much. So yeah. they don't see how um, others are appropriating their arguments for their schism and heresy. Um, so I'm trying to show the lack of consistency consistency and how, well, the solution that is sometimes being presented and provided to deal with the crisis undermines us elsewhere. So how about we drop these arguments and these solutions and look for something that's more consistent? Because I do believe that there are solutions and ways to understand the crisis without entering into schism or heresy or leaving and, the church. You know? and, and, and let's be clear, and we've demonstrated this, uh, uh, and you could see it, you don't have to do a lot of looking. Um, it, you, we've demonstrated on the show. You could see it everywhere. What was that Lutheran pastor? You were, you, he used yeah. martial style arguments on the video. You, yeah, I mean, I, 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 he, he, East Orthodox used martial style arguments as what reason to leave the church. Re yeah, and, I, and I've watched people at my parish leave the church over these arguments. Yeah, I, I encounter it a lot. And so um, maybe for people who aren't really dealing with Eastern Orthodoxy, this is new to them. But for those who are dealing with that area, um, some of this is going to be very familiar, some of these arguments. And especially when they pertain to ecclesiology, uh, you start to notice that, wait, actually, this is in favor. In fact, I saw, I'm not going to name who they are, but it, it is, although it is public knowledge, uh, two really well-known um, theologians, if you will, uh, apologists for the um, kind of more of the reactionary traditionalist movement. They do have PhDs. Uh, both of them didn't realize it, but one of my friends posted a quote by an Eastern Orthodox saint who was criticizing the Pope and justifying 
dissent and schism, being not in, in communion with the Pope, was justifying uh, the position that it's not necessary to be in communion with the papacy. And the very quote that was used to justify that, they read it and said, I don't see anything wrong with it. <laughs> and it was unbelievable because, but, but wait, this is actually a quote from an Eastern Orthodox saint justifying dissent and schism and a lack of communion with the papacy and saying that it's not essential to be in communion with Pope and you have no problem assenting to that, why are you still Catholic? It, materially speaking, at least, you've already left the church. Materially, you're already in schism when you maintain that. I can't make any judgments on them, formally speaking. But materially, you've already accepted the Eastern Orthodox position once you think that uh, being in communion with the uh, papacy is not absolutely indispensable and essential. So it, it's just interesting kind of see, seeing some of that. But anyways, I'm sorry to. No, you know, it's, it's but I mean, it. but again, the, again, because, and this is, this comes out of the question of, the, is this a weird obsession, Michael and me and Kevin? No, it's, there's a, there's a moral purpose. And if that moral purpose disappears, I'll never talk about this again. That's why I don't, I have no personal attachment to any of these things. Now, let's go ahead briefly. Go ahead. Mr. Lofton, you talked about, you know, how people are trying to cope with things going on in the church and um, La Madre, Pascalina Leonard, uh, uh, she was the Pius XII's housekeeper for 41 years and her godson is still alive, Father Murray. He wrote this book about conversations that they had in Rome. They were talking about, at one point, um, the false private revelations in Bayside, New York. And she said this, that I think is just absolutely apropos of what you said. She said on pages 119 of the book, these poor people, and they are not alone, she added, as if somehow to include herself among their number, they're trying to deal with a real inner conflict. They are struggling to comprehend the incomprehensible. They are desperate to know what has happened to that once solid, unchanging, infallible church of theirs. The true faith inherited from their ancestors, learned at their mother's knees, loved and held near and dear unto death. Nothing is making sense to them any longer. Don't you see, Don Carlo, they would be willing to accept the most bizarre hypothesis in the world, the Pope being held captive and replaced by an actor as insane as that sounds, they somehow could find that easier to believe than what they actually see happening with the church they so dearly love. <laughs> and what has been happening, Caro Don Carlo, is far from over. The devil isn't finished yet. No, not yet. The apostasy is only beginning. She nailed it. And I'll say that. She okay. nailed it. Smart woman. So... All right. Now I'm going to go this this section. I'll try to move through it quick because it, you know this is this has all been preparatory. So the uh, uh, the first substantial section is 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 methodological. So um, I'm going to talk about it's basically some philosophical just for a little bit, uh, and I won't bore you too long. I'm going to talk about some philosophical considerations about conspiracy, uh, about narrative thinking, and I'm going to be drawing heavily from uh, Edward Fazer on this. Uh, if when we put the bibliography up, they're all in there and you can go look at them. You can read them yourself since I'm going to have to cover this quickly. And now, first of all, I want to talk about conspiracy theory. Uh, I'm not using conspiracy theory in the usual way. I'm not just talking about, you know, it, of course, there's conspiracies. People can get together and plot to do stuff. That's no, that's not a problem. Duh. Um what uh, if, if people could even get together and plot to do a big thing. I mean, all, uh, you know, the U.S. government got together and had a plot to conduct uh, uh, the U.S. campaign of World War II. That's not uh, that's not out of bounds. That duh. But the um, the question of the conspiracy theory, uh, the 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 narrative of the conspiracy theory, is, is more important when you read books like this. Now. As far as Taylor Marshall goes, um, this book is not full-blown uh, uh, conspiracy theory in the classical sense. So we don't have um, JFK and the Grassy Knoll, and you know, all this. Not it's, it's not that bad because uh, Taylor has some stop gaps to get it, to keep him from going too far into speculative. But he still has, and I talked about this briefly before, but I'll, I'll say it again. He still has some epistemic 
tendencies, epistemic is just a philosophical word that means having to do with knowledge. He has some tendencies uh, about what he assumes about knowledge, what he assumes about sort of what you can take as evidence that push the narrative in a particular way. So it's, it's, it's flatly obvious that he has a, a hermeneutic of suspicion, that he, has an op, that he has a particular skepticism about at least anything to do with the church and what the church says it's doing uh, uh, you know, at any given moment. The church tells you why, um, you know, the church says perfectly well what the uh, Alta uh, Vendita is. I mean, it, it's, it was, you know, it's, it's in church documents what they think it is. The church uh, has a particular uh, directions about the uh, apparition of Our Lady of La Salette. The, the church uh, has, a, has particular things it says about the papal states uh, and the people involved have particular things they say about it. Um, the, 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 there's a documented things about the, the Leonine prayers. There's documented things about Fatima. There's, um, uh, there's, there's clear teaching about modernism, uh, about the liturgy, about Vatican II, about the papal elections, about whatever you want. These are all publicly available things. There's publicly available testimonies from everybody involved. And yet, we're not supposed to ask, the, we're not supposed to do what you normally do in history or whatever, which is just go, okay, what are my primary sources? Let me put them together. If we have some conflicts, let's, you know, fix it. If we have some gaps, we'll, you know, let's look for evidence. Uh, you know, if we, you know, the conflicts will reconcile. Oh, and then we can build some hypotheses on the basis of these testimonies. That's not what we do. We're not even doing basic biblical level studies. No, we're just going to assume all that's probably wrong, probably a lie. And then we're going to find, we're going to pick and choose things that support a narrative about a secret and hidden thing, a, a, a hypothetical a, a series of, of actions behind what you see. And really it's this hypothetical series of actions that explains what you see. That's, that's the primary epistemic problem. Uh, in, in, uh, you could look at this in a lot of ways. I mean, in philosophy of science, you might want to say that the, the narrative, that, the, that this way of reason is going to tend towards non-falsifiability. Um, uh, or you might want to say that the narrative is going to tend towards um, being overly hypothetical with very little support. Uh, I, I tend to say that um, books like this, Marshall in particular, tends to engage in shotgun argumentation. So you'll just put out, you'll put out, so you're going to say, you get a, a, a conclusion. Um, the, the church is infiltrated and the present pope has, by virtue of this infiltration, been placed on the chair of Peter um, as uh, some kind of Masonic entity, however he wants to think about that. And uh, how do I show that? Well, uh, here's 20 things that were bad. You make the connections. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not how we establish knowledge. And uh, the problem is, is that Marshall, uh, as a student of Thomas, as a student of biblical theology, as, a, as any kind of, if he weren't a professor, I'd, it'd be one thing. But he is. If he didn't have a PhD, it'd be one thing. But he does. As an academic, he knows that the reasoning he's operating with is not epistemically sustainable, that you could not justify any thesis on the basis of it, but he does it anyway. Uh, and so I don't, I can't even tell if he's fallen for it or if he knows that this is the conventional wisdom and uh, he's just going to pass it along. Um, what, what, what's, what's, what, what's another big issue? See, another big issue is you get into narrative thinking. Narrative thinking, and uh, if you, I, in philosophy, uh, continental philosophy is, is notoriously um, uh, prone to narrative thinking, but so is analytic philosophy, if you know what I'm talking about. Narrative thinking is a blurring between the lines of an argument, a philosophical argument especially, but I mean, this happens in sociology, it happens in all sorts of fields. A blurring between the lines of an argument and just a story. That is to say, what's the difference? An argument is going to have um, a conclusion and supporting premises of different kinds. So if it's a if it's an if it's a, an inductive argument, you're going to say, you know, with some probability, the, this specific evidence entails 
uh, the likelihood of this conclusion. Or if it's a deductive argument, you're going to say that this premise and this premise by way of rules of in, uh, deduction entail this conclusion. That's that's an argument. OK, the, in some way, the thing said um, guarantee or shore up or make follow a conclusion. A narrative is just a series of sentences. Just what A, B, C, D, E. I got up today. Um, I went to my car. Uh, I uh, went to the store. Uh, I bought milk. I came back here. I drank it. Um, you could say it would be improper to say that I drank it is the conclusion of an argument and then say that the supports were I got up. Uh, I walked to my car. Uh, I, you know, I got started the car. I, I drove to the store and I came back. Those are not, not drank. I drank it does not follow from those sentences by any rule of inference whatsoever, by any inductive logic, what it just doesn't follow. And it's very easy to, especially in inductive reasoning, but even in, even in more strict reasoning, it's very easy to slip between um, uh, 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 just a set of statements about what went on and a demonstration of any sort. So, I mean, for instance, um, um, he here's a case that happens all the time. He had a certain look on his face and um, he seemed to be in a hurry. Therefore, he's angry. Well, that's a narrative uh, that looks like an argument and you could probably make it an argument. You'd, you'd have to be something like, well, he has a look on his face and looks of that sort uh, typically within a certain range indicate anger. Um, and uh, people also get uh, frustrated and in a hurry when they're angry with a certain probability. And therefore within a certain probability, he's angry. That would be how you would slide. That would be how you tr transform the narrative into um, an argument, but most people don't, you, I mean, a lot of people aren't even aware of that. You, you really kind of have to have at least some uh, uh, native scholarly training to, to, to make that strong distinction. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to mess it up. And, um, it's, and it's okay in ordinary conversation because people fill in the gaps. But when you're trying to do a scholarly book, when you're trying to make an argument, when you're trying to you know, demonstrate that something is going on, and that's what he's doing. He clearly says uh, in his own characterization that he's trying to demonstrate a plot. Okay, what's that mean? That people got together and did something for a certain end. Uh, well, you're going to have to show me how do you know that? And it can't just be, um, you know, the, which what it literally is. It can't just be um, Our Lady appeared in La Salette. Uh, 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 the Pope wrote a prayer uh, because of secret societies, maybe. Uh, Freemasonry doesn't like the church. Our Lady of Fatima appeared. Uh, there were bad consequences uh, to the council. Therefore, uh, Pope Francis was instituted as a Masonic agent on the papal throne. That's not an argument. That's not how anything works. You gotta make the connections. Uh, otherwise you just told me, uh, might as well just told me a fairy story. It's no good. And even if everything's true, by the way, you didn't make the connection. And that's a problem. And it's a problem because why are you trying to demonstrate a plot? What's wrong with that? Because a plot is a causal story of what caused what to happen. You're not just giving me a, a freak show of all the bad stuff that happened over the last 200 years and oh, be sad. Uh, you're not, it's not poetry. You're trying to demonstrate how this caused this, caused this, caused this. And if you're not trying to do that, you need to tell me that. You need to tell me that you're making sad church poetry, not that you're demonstrating a plot on the form of causation. And Marshall knows the distinction because he's read Thomas, he studied Thomas, he knows from Aristotle and Thomas, how a causal narrative, how a causal account works and how it's different from poetry. And if he can't do that, I dare say he needs to go back and, and, and restudy, but I bet he does know. So uh, it's, it's malfeasant. Uh, on top of that, uh, uh, you, you've got it. They, this, this is a, the causal problem in history, but on top of that, 
and we'll talk about this a little later, um, you've got issues where he confuses, and especially when he tries to defend himself. You've got issues uh, where he confuses abstracta and uh, and things, concrete things. You know, um, there's a difference between cat to be a cat. You know, to be a cat, four-legged furry mammal that meows, right? And that cat over there on my couch. Okay, that cat is over there on my couch breathing. Okay, that's uh, that's a thing. Uh, we do not say that cat or cats or what it is to be a cat per se is over there on my couch breathing. That's nuts. Catness does not breathe. It does not. It's it's substantiated in things. And then you might go, oh, that's dumb. Well, who's making that kind of confusion? Well, anybody who talks about things like Freemasonry understood as an ideology, the Freemasonic. What is that? The you know the Freemasonic walked down the street to get. Uh, ice cream. That makes no sense. The Freemason might walk down the street to get some ice cream. The Freemason might go to a lodge meeting. The Freemasonic does not go to a lodge meeting. That makes no sense. Uh, or, um, you know, communism. What do you mean? Do you mean this group of people who operated under the ideology of communism, say the Soviet Union, or, or the, all, everybody who operated under that ideology as a collective? Or do you mean communism understood as a, as a, a political ideology or a, a, a way of social thinking? Because the whole group of communists together could stab people or could uh, uh, you know go crazy or could starve themselves or whatever you want. But communism, understood as a set of ideas, can't stab anybody, can't go walk down the street. Uh, and and we, why is this important? Because he'll he'll flip and flop, but but it'll it'll he'll flip and flop on the connections he's drawing on the basis of a confusion. So uh, this is a core like a core issue. Are these people that he wants to talk about Freemasons or are they Freemasonic? And I'll talk about this in a minute. If they're Freemasons, that is to say, if a bunch of Freemasons did something together, then they can cause a, another thing to happen. But the Freemasonic can't get together and cause things to happen. People have to act in a Freemasonic way. And on top of that, the Freemasonic, understood as a political idea, has different character than... Um, uh, uh, people who are Freemasons. Uh, it, 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 it only will establish certain kinds of connections. It, 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 you know, um, you, you can, you, we know certain things about how um, uh, ideologies and how um, ideas and things connect. And so you can make inferences from ideas, but you certainly can't make causal inferences in the history of events simply on the basis of connections between ideas that's crazy that's the that that's uh, that would what, that would be like saying um blue is a color and green is a color uh and red is a color therefore in history um uh, blue things came first uh, and then bumped into red things and then bumped into green things uh you can't move, make that move but if you say that blue is a uh th there's a blue thing and it came at time T1, and then there's a blue thing that came at time T2, and there's a blue thing that, ca that came at time T3, and they're in a, an interaction of movement, you can make that kind of inference. And uh, that's non-trivial <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, of the slippage that we have uh, in these notions as we go through the book. Uh, and I, I wanted to remark on that in general, and I could, I could talk about it in particular later. Um, did anybody want to talk about this just very briefly before we move on to something sort of more substantial you uh, you approach it from the from the philosophical perspective and in some ways i approach it from the much uh, lower shall we say angle of, uh, of of language uh because of my language background i kind of have the grammar run into my head and i know one of the things that i had i, I had observed was at one point when speaking to bunini marshall says he is an infiltrated priest well, that's a very bad usage of the past participle infiltrated. You know, he, he he may have infiltrated, but you can't say someone is an infiltrated priest. That doesn't make any sense. You know, I saw from the level of just language and linguistics, but uh, when you were talking about something similar, it kind of triggered my brain there. And uh, It's not a major point, of course, that I observed, but I was just kind of like, it, it bespeaks of the larger problem of overusing language that is present in the book. 
and Marshall has done that even on Twitter, in fact. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I may have something here uh, that kind of points that out. Let me double check my, as soon as it wants to load. Um, he, uh, he said something to the effect of, oh, yes, uh, here it is. Uh, back on October 8th of last year, I don't know if does everybody remember when we had that situation with that priest who was committed that horrible sacrilege down in Louisiana on the altar yeah. of his women? Marshall had tweeted about it back on October 8th, and he, he says, quote, Catholic priest having a sacrilegious orgy on a Catholic altar, more infiltration. That is an abuse of the term infiltration because, again, you'd have to prove that this priest was some kind of an agent put there by people who wanted to use him for the infiltration of the church. Uh, so it, it's just, it's again, it's a buzzword. At this point, we're dealing with buzzwords. Uh, and it didn't make any sense. Now, granted, this isn't the biggest point in the world, but it does speak to the larger problem that's going on here. We're dealing with buzzwords that don't actually speak to uh, uh, th that 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 have some problems to them. Shall we? I guess the best way to put it. Um, All right. And since this is methodological, I don't want to get caught up too much on it. So, uh, but it, it's important. It'll come up because it's it's a linchpin in different issues. Okay. So, what's okay? Well, let's go into the content of the book. Okay. This is the what's the narrative of infiltration. And I'm adapting this account from uh, it's, and I know not everybody loves uh, um, uh, uh, where Peter is, but it's it's Lafferty's the synthesis of all Catholic conspiracy theory. But I mean, you can read it yourself, uh, or uh, you can read the material, or you can read other reviews if if you, you want to confirm it. Okay, the central thesis of infiltration is this: the Catholic Church is in crisis because the enemies of Christ plotted organized efforts to place a pope for Satan on the Roman chair of St. Peter. It has been a slow, patient plan to establish a satanic revolution with the pope as a puppet. One, Marshall leaves no doubt that he believes this pope for Satan is Pope Francis. The story begins with a document entitled The Permanent Institution of the Alta Vendita, which was allegedly written by a member of an Italian secret society, the Carbonari, sometime in the first half of the 19th century. The goal of the plot proposed in this document was, as Marshall puts it, to one day have a Freemasonic naturalist pope reigning on the chair of St. Peter. Two, with the election of Pope Francis by the Sankt Gallen Mafia, so-called, of corrupt cardinals, Marshall alleges this goal was reached. Mission accomplished for the Sankt Gallen Mafia. At least they delivered the world uh, a revolution in Tierra and Cope, as had been, as had been pro prophesied by the Freemasonic document Alta Vendita more than 150 years before. After a slow patient revolution, they had secured a pope according to our heart. Pope Francis's worldview and philosophy, Marshall states, is essentially that of a 19th century member of the Freemasonic Carbonari. And how does he justify it? He justifies it by a long narrative. Uh, he's, it's it's going to start with uh, the uh, he, what he calls the Italian branch of Freemasonry, and the plan uh, called the Carbonari, and their plan to infiltrate the church. Uh, it's going to go from that to uh, uh, the specific, per what he calls the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita, which is a document from that period. Um, it was He's going to say it's a process recognized by the popes. He's going to say that Our Lady of La Salette warned about the plot and prophesied the consequences of it. Uh, Pope Pius IX, is going to recognize an external conspiracy of socialism, communism against the church. Uh, and, and it's going to be said, this is why he added new prayers to follow all low masses. I think that would be Pope Leo, not Pope Leo. Uh, Pope Leo uh, sensed the demonic infiltration, uh, which is why he added, oh, I see. Yeah, those there. Which is why he amended and added uh, 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 the Saint Michael the Archangel the, uh, to prayer to the low mass. Uh, so he says, uh, the uh, Freemasons uh, then erect 
a statue of uh, Giorgiano Bruno in Rome, uh, but as a sign, apparently, of their plan to infiltrate the clergy and elect a pope uh, who would be, quote, pantheistic, naturalistic, relativistic, and universalistic. Uh, pope Pius X then is supposed to have taken direct action against the infiltration, this, this background plot that's going on, uh, by recognizing modernism uh, uh, in, in the encyclical Pashindi. Uh, and uh, this, these are all supposed to be the same thing. Um, under Pope Pius XI, communists began infiltrating. This is supposed to be related to the prior, uh, and it's supposed to have been proven by Belladad uh, um, and, uh, and Manning Johnson uh, in their testimony to the uh, House Committee on Un-American Activities. Um, and then also, a Father Annabel Bunini is supposed to be shown as an infiltrator, infiltrator and a Freemason, uh, and this is supposed to be the continuation of this uh, story. Pope Pius XII, uh, weakened by disease, is supposed to have been uh, fallen under the influence of Bunini, Augustine Bea, uh, and the future Pope Paul VI. Uh, in order to uh, further this, they're apparent, these three people are apparently crypto-modernists. Uh, they, uh, they are known to be crypto-modernists because uh, one of them met with Saul Alinsky, which is supposed to establish that by way of Jacques Maritain, who liked Alinsky. Uh, Bea uh, was engaged in a process of uh, interreligious infiltration with his apparent Bea Salter, uh, I, which if that's supposed to help. And uh, Marshall asserts uh, that because Bea uh, liked the new ecumenism, uh, uh, and uh, uh, interacting with uh, Jews in a positive way um, and changing uh, certain things in the liturgy, it's supposed to be established. Um, uh, after a possibly, then, after a possibly rigged election of Pope John the XXIII, uh, everything's supposed to be going really fast. Uh, this Pope uh, is a truly Freemasonic Pope, convenes the council, um, ignores the third secret of Fatima, which is supposed to be a demonstration. He's part of this plot. Um, and uh, uh, goes ahead and initiates a, a great apostasy in the church through the council um, and through these malign influences. Uh, this all leads to the creation of the Novus Ordo liturgy and Novus Ordo ecumenism, which is supposed to be a further part of this plot. Uh, Paul VI continues the Second Vatican Council, continues the alleged modernism, uh, 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 supervises Dignitatis Humanae and Nostra Aetate, which are supposed to be modernist Masonic documents. Uh, and then after the council, a Masonic reform was led by its so-called chief architect, that was again, Annabel Bunini. Uh, it was resisted by Lefebvre, Lefebvre and Cardinal Ottavani, and their resistance is supposed to demonstrate how bad it is. Um, meanwhile, uh, you can see from key indicators of social decline in Catholicism uh, that all this is demonstrated, uh, parish attendance, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then, if we get really disassociated, then, Paul the si then under Paul VI, the Vatican Bank was infiltrated by a Freemason and possible mafioso, uh, Michel the Shark Sedona, uh, causing scandal and a misappropriation of funds, which then is supposed to be a continuation of this plot. Then Paul VI was alleged to have a homosexual relationship, which he denied. For, we know that for some reason. Then Paul uh, limits the voting age of cardinals so that he can further this plot and his agenda. Then Pope John Paul II is elected uh, and dies shortly thereafter, and probably definitely because of poisoning, which is probably definitely because of this ongoing plot. Then John Paul II is elected, for some reason, uh, and an assassination attempt was made on him numerous times, probably in connection with this plot. His uh, ecumenical adventures uh, in line with this plot scandalized many, uh, and he, oppose, he oppresses uh, traditional Catholics under Lefebvre. Uh, and then towards the end of the pontificate, the Sankt Gallen Mafia gets together, culminates this over a century long plot to elect a free Masonic prelate, they are initially unsuccessful during the election of Benedict XVI, who was probably induced to resign. And then they managed to get the uh, Pope Francis elected as a culmination of this story. 
Uh, also, by the way, Cardinal McCarrick uh, infiltrated the church uh, by way of some convoluted route having to do with the fact that he was in the same area as the St. Gallen Mafia one time. So uh, that's the story that we read. Uh, so let's start looking at it. That that about right, Kevin? That suit your memory? Yeah. It, it, uh, in the words of one of my priest friends, I won't mention him because I don't think he'd want me to do that. He said, the only thing that Marshall's book is good for is that it puts all the conspiracy theories in chronological order. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, look, uh, if anybody wants to say I left something out, uh, I didn't get it, you know, that, you know, that I, that I don't get, that I don't hit the highlights of this narrative, please tell me. Like, well, well, you did, uh, you, you've got the, the general thrust of the story, and this is where actually one of Marshall's innovations come in that I mentioned. In the traditionalist literature, which, by the way, none of this is original to Marshall, this is all within the traditionalist literature. I've been reading it for over 20 years myself. Yeah. That's why I was able this to read is in, it. This is in dozens and dozens of books. I've seen this everywhere. I've seen this in old magazines from yeah. 1982. Okay. Exactly. And so I, I, I could prep when I was reading the book two years ago, I could pretty much predict what was going to happen next. But, the, but here's one thing that I noticed Marshall innovating. The revolution in Cope and Tiara that was in the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita has been attributed in the past to John the 23rd. Marshall innovates that and says, no, it's Pope Francis. So now yeah. you have this disagreement even within the traditionalist uh, uh, world worldview. But I, I thought it was very interesting innovation. And I'm like, okay, I don't really, I don't really know how to accept this and, and kind of think about it. But nevertheless, that is one of his innovations. Well, they, so you have a lot of reasons. So obviously, and uh, uh, I won't talk about this very long, but uh, it's obvious that probably because of his conversion, Taylor Marshall has a certain reserve, especially about uh, uh, Pope John Paul II and um, Benedict, especially Benedict the Sixteenth. Uh, he clearly, even when he talks poorly about John Paul II, it's clear on my reading that uh, he thinks that these are sort of like bad ideas or bad influences on him. And um, when he talks about it, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a meta issue that I'll talk about in a minute when we talk about Freemasonry. When he talks about it, he'll, he'll, he'll sh when he defends things like this, he'll shift from, oh, he's part of a plot to, oh, he's influenced by the, the, uh, the Freemasonic stuff. He's influenced by the idea, so he'll shift back and forth. So he 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 doesn't, to my knowledge, ever allege that um, either Benedict the Sixteenth or uh, um, or um, uh, 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 John uh, John the, Paul, John Paul II are uh, directly participating sociologically in these plots. Uh, he he he's he's going to say that it's a it's a an influence. Well, but well, well, he, he clearly thinks he clearly thinks Francis is in sociologically involved in some way, though. But, but this is what this is kind of that phrase in the in the Alta Vendita that let them think that they are marching under the banner of the apostolic keys when in fact they're really working for us. That's the kind of idea. In other words, like there's this great wool that's been pulled over everybody's eyes, including the Pope's. That's the idea here that is behind some of the traditionalist literature, you know. But uh, but really, before we get, it's kind of pushing this back a little bit. Towards the beginning, when you talk about, I mean, I, I have to say this because uh, in all fairness, you know, as the author of the world's leading book on the history of Leo's vision, you know, um, it is true. Leo had some serious issues with, with, uh, with what was taking place with Giordano Bruno. I did come across this in my studies. They did erect... That statue, yeah, in the late that's real, and um, and they did do it as a symbol of how they were not going to just destroy the temporal power of the papacy, which had been lost at that point by about about twenty years or so. But they had, I, I, I remember reading this in my research. I can't cite it off the top of my head, but I can honestly, I stand on my own authority as the guy who wrote the book. Uh, I they they did do it deliberately with the intent to try to destroy even the spiritual power of the papacy. Um, and they, they, Giordano Bruno was, in fact, kind of their symbol for this free thinking. And that's why, uh, you know, to this day, for a lot of people, that statue that still stands in Campo dei Fiori, 
in 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 Rome is in it's it's placed in such a way where the Pope would open up a window in the Vatican and you have to see the statue. You know, it, it really was it really was symbolic and it wasn't a front deliberately done to the papacy. Sure, uh, and and it, it's much like naming the roads in Paris Voltaire Lane or whatever you want or you know Rousseau uh, Ave, uh, Avenue. There's no there's no doubt that it has uh, ideological meaning. Uh, nobody, oh, very, nobody, nobody should very, deny any of that. Yeah, um, very, very, very much so. You know, and like with the with the issue of the Leonine prayers, you know, it, it is true. Leo did have a vision. We know we know very little of it, though. There wasn't that conversation. That is according to the best information we have. There wasn't the conversation between Jesus and Satan, where you know, a hundred years was given to the church. Uh, it was given over to the devil to test the church. That's not necessarily uh, verifiable in, in the in the literature that's available on the subject. It might be, but no, it hasn't it hasn't manifested itself just yet. So, but the the vision involved demons, and the Italian word used by Cardinal Massali was adensavano, and it's a cooking term meaning thickening. So they were right. gathering in, in, uh, for, in their forces upon the Eternal City, uh, aka Rome. That's really all that we know. And that Leo did, in fact, write that prayer, and added it uh, to the. Uh, oh, he gutted he gutted the original oratio, uh, and then he added the Saint Michael prayer after it. And when you, I mean, oh, the arguments are in my book, of course. But when you, it was very serious. Like, it, but it was deeply rooted in what was going on at the time with the church and the loss of the papal states, which was why, in 1929, when the Lateran Treaty was signed. And the Pope had some measure of temporal power back, and the Roman question had been settled. There was actually a, there was actually another question: What do we do with the Leonine the prayers after Mass? You know, um, and uh, one of the cardinals did in fact step up, who was on the commission, uh, and say, "No, in fact, this had to do with Freemasonry." He did. He, he said that. Uh, we don't know the name of the cardinal though, but it was Father Francisco Brim who witnessed it. Uh, who witnessed he was there present in the meeting but he wouldn't name the cardinal but uh it has something to do with freemasonry so pius the, uh, the 11th then modified the intention of the prayers not for the resolution of the roman question anymore but now for russia and that ties into fatima let me um let's go ahead the, so now we're going to deal with more substantial uh, the we're going to talk first about Freemasonry, and I had to do some research, and I never wanted to research Freemasons, but I did. So, um, what's what is Freemasonry? Okay, so Freemasonry, and this is hardly intelligible to any to anybody today, uh, because people don't join social clubs anymore for reasons. If you want to go get the book Bowling Alone. You can see a, a whole sociological account of the decline of things like Freemasonic lodges and, and the Rotary Club and bowling clubs and whatever you like. So today's people don't, the, the, this movement doesn't make any sense. But imagine before TV and the internet and uh, all the things that you uh, fill the, uh, uh, the uh, blank space of your life with, that the ordinary, um, you know, leisure uh, of your existence might be uh, taken up by books, uh, sort of frivolity, um, church, um, you know, festivals, um, you know, the, the, uh, and, and, and meetings with friends. Okay. That's, that's the, that's what it's like to live before the present era. And um, at around the time, just, just after the Protestant Reformation, uh, and, and going all through about 1900, 1950, it was, and you could, the, like the only kind of vestiges you still, still see floating around um, that still kind of operate the same way are college fraternities or, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit the Knights of Columbus who were created in imitation, but people, don't, they don't operate the same. Uh, around the time, they developed sort of a sociological movement to have these kind of societies of men. Um, it's hard to, so basically after the plagues, after the reformation, after you sort of had a, an explosion in the trades uh, in, in men of the, of the, of the sort of, we would call them the middle class today. Um, you had a large group of people 
who had some time, who had some ability to read, to think, uh, uh, 15, 1600, um, uh, and, and they could sort of come together and get together and discuss ideas, discuss what they want to do with the world, and ultimately discuss sort of how they want to change the world. And this is because an increase in productivity due to a lot of different things. Um, and by the way, if you want to read the full story of this, I really recommend John Dickey's The Craft, How Freemasonry Shaped the Modern World, if, if I recall. Um, it's, it's a beautiful book that, that goes through the whole history of this. And um, they, these ultimately men came up with sort of the idea of the secret society. And the secret society was really, it was these group of men and they would have um, get, basically get together, it's basically social meetings, but they would make for themselves out of stuff that was common in the guild tradition in the middle ages, secret rites and rituals um, that they would use to bond each other together as a group committed to the same thing. And, uh, uh, you, you know, in order to filter out sort of good and bad men, and, you know, in order to work on what they're going to do, you know, what are we going to do with our, you know, that, now that we have money, what are we going to do now that we have land? What are we going to do now that we can do things? And they would have these secrets, they would have these groups um, to work on that. And Freemasonry starts primarily as a group committed to basically personal um, virtue, understood in, like in, the, in the modern sense, sort of like um, Benjamin Franklin, Paul Richard's Almanac, early to bed, early to rise kind of stuff is what you see in early Masonic literature, conjoined with, especially in, in England, conjoined with a lot of like rituals, you know, so that we know who's in on the group and who's out, uh, you know, so that you have a clear point of initiation. Of course, it's also very familiar because you're used to religion, which has religious rites that are uh, cultic uh, and sectarian in function. And lots and lots of people joined up to these things as a, as a networking group. Uh, today, the closest things like, the you know, it's a little crass, but the closest stuff now is like, it's like Facebook. It's like Facebook. It's like LinkedIn. It's a networking group in, in the context of an of a early modern society uh, for the development of ideas to get to know basically middle and upper class people to be able to talk and, and have influential friends and to be able to work on yourself when you might not otherwise be able to. Now, this has, you know, ends up having a lot of problems because why? Because the enlightenment is starting at this period. People are getting certain ideas about how the world ought to be rearranged, how the economy ought to be re rearranged, how about how politics and thinking ought to be rearranged. And these typically already starting with the Protestant Reformation, but even philosophically, even sociologically, these are typically going to oppose, the certainly the Catholic Church and even state churches. They're going to oppose traditional thinking about ideas. They're going to oppose traditional thinking about the social order. And they're usually going to put forward the individual as uh, the core of things. And the church has always noted this, has always talked about this. Uh, these societies would tend to advocate um, for enlightenment uh, would tend to, and th this would be understood as a kind of individual liberation. And among the secret societies that popped up, the Freemasons uh, were a very successful variant. Uh, they start in, uh, they start in uh, the English speaking world um, uh, and they have various, um, you know, variations of how they operate. Uh, they have various sects and groups and societies that develop over time. And this spreads to the continent over time and which produces various other sects um, and uh, 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 groups uh, and variations of the rituals, of the ideas. But the whole point is you have a loose, um, vaguely affiliated, primarily ideologically affiliated, primarily. So they all have common constitutional documents that they refer to. They have a kind of common practice they refer to. Um, and this is how they keep together. And they're in correspondence. Some of the Masonic sects are um, organized under like major guilds uh, with more or less authority. Some of them sort of operate in a kind of loose way. Um, uh, you know, where you'll have a guild here and a guild here and a guild here, and they kind of have the same idea and they have the same constitution forming how they operate. And they just talk and they kind of work on the same things because they all have the same ideas, but they, nobody's under anybody else's authority. 
That's then that's the basic template. That's how it works as time goes on. And of course, because these people would be middle class, because they would be aristocratic class, they would be involved in every political change. If you had, um, uh, you know, an, an expert, a technician of some sort, uh, if you had a kind of aristocratic advisor in your court, if you had, uh, you know, a craftsman of any sort, uh, there was a pretty good chance that he would be in some kind of a free, uh, free secret society. And there was a pretty good chance that because the most successful is the Freemasonic secret societies, that uh, he'd be a Freemason uh, anywhere in Europe from, you know, 1700 until um, 1900. And, okay, so that gets us to where we are. So what's, what's going on? So um, as... European history develops. Freemasons are constantly present. Lots of other groups are present uh, causing, rev I mean, the revolution strike, the revolutions hit. And of course, Freemasons are involved in them because lots of people are in Freemasonry uh, and they have certain ideas and they're uh, influential men, of course. And of course, the revolutions are in accordance with their ideas, but those ideas are in accordance with a lot of people's ideas, not just Freemasonry in particular. And you get to a certain point where um, after, where you, you'll start getting competitions between both groups of Freemasons. So there's a major, there's a major set of schisms within Freemasonry and also uh, secret societies that don't agree. So this gets us to the Carbonari, which is what Marshall's concerned with. So the Carbonari are a secret society that forms in Italy uh, sometime around and after the French Revolution in particular. And they are, they get, end up getting involved in resistance to Napoleonic occupation in various parts of France. Uh, so in, in various parts of Italy, or well, it's before Italy, but so the various Italian states. And the Carbonari, and Marshall apparently has no idea, are a secret society usually opposed to the Freemasons. Why? Because the, at this time, the Freemasons were uh, propped up with and organized by uh, and sponsored by the Napoleonic state. So you would have Lots of stuff where the um, uh, the French are sending in military men who are Freemasons, and they get to end up getting opposed by Carbonari because the Carbonari don't like French occupation, uh, and so you'll have fights of secret societies, and you'll have attempts to comp uh, oppress the Carbonari. Um, this stuff happens all the time. It's a it's a it's a sociologically complex set of actors. The Carbonari. Um, and the Freemasons differ in the following way. The Carbonari are primarily an Italian secret society with very Italy-specific ideas about how to generate reform, primarily towards the forging of a unified Italian republic. And what's the problem from the point of view of the church? Despite the fact, uh, in on top of the fact that the church at this point has generally speaking opposed secret societies, and you can read all about that in, for instance, uh, the Catholic Catechism on Freemasonry by David Gray, uh, who's an ex-Muslim, uh, who's an ex-Mason, uh, but uh, you can also read about it in The Craft, you can also read about it in a number of other places. Um, despite, uh, in addition to the fact that the church is generally opposed secret societies because they tend to be pro-enlightenment, anti-church, pro-bourgeois revolutions of various kinds, um, which also disfavor the church. Uh, uh, you're, you, they also, the Carbonari, are going to be involved in what? In overthrowing the papal state. Why? Because the king of the papal state is the pope. And obviously the pope doesn't want a republic uh, in, in his territory. Because why? That would mean he's not the leader of the state. Uh, and he can't, obviously, for theological reasons, for political reasons, he can't accept that. So any, but any Italian attempting to form um, a, a, a republic is going to be opposed to the Pope. And so they're going to make all kinds of plans to oppose the Pope. And you have to understand that at its high point, the, 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 the Carbonari might have had 600,000 members, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of members in these secret societies. And by secret, you just mean groups of men that have things that they keep private, that they don't talk about. But everybody knew about these societies. Now, 
That gets you into the middle of the 19th century uh, and the Alta Vendita. The Alta Vendita, and there's a lot of books about this. Um, you could read it. It's, it's in the, the Popes and the European Revolution. Uh, uh, it's, it's in uh, Dickey's The Craft. Um, but the, the Alta Vendita is a little plot by a very small group of men uh, where they're essentially, it's like a discord chat. They've got a set of letters going and they come up with ideas about how they're going to overthrow um, uh, the, the papal states so that they can unify, ultimately so that they can unify Italy under a republic because that's what they've been, that's, their, that's the idea of every enlightenment society for 200 years. That's what everybody's been working on. That's uh, what every intellectual has been working on for a long time. And uh, they come up with stuff like, well, you know, obvious stuff like, well, you know, let's get some priests, you know, and let's and let's try to get some bishops and, you know, let's try, you know, let's try to, you know, work it out. And this is a little different than the Freemasons because the Freemasons tended to operate with like military force if they could get it because they're very successful. So they, a, Freemason, a Freemasonic plan would just be, oh, get the military that you're affiliated to march in and take it over. Uh the Carbonari don't have that kind of position, and so they have ideas about uh, subversion and infiltration and um, tricks uh, that they want to spread by teaching. And uh, that's perfectly sociologically plausible. And so they speculate out, uh, and you can look into, you know, the what we can understand by this. One member of them, a, a piccolo tigre, the small tiger, whatever, speculates out this little... Man manifesto he writes out and sends to his group uh, that Marshall puts out, and um, it, it 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 it's it's, a, it's an idea they're all circulating, and then they go defunct. Why? Because they get caught, or because um, you know they're not successful, uh, and so somebody else has to do the ultimate overthrow of the papal states that they want to do. Um, but the whole point of that is to say that this is a, a, a kind of private letter that gets discovered later and published by um, uh, church historians um, on secret societies as a kind of warning, as a kind of warning of the kind of ideas these people have. But it's no mystery that they had these ideas, but it's perfectly good to look at them. And in as far as when we're talking about secret societies, and we're talking about Freemasonry in general. We're talking about enlightenment ideas. It's perfectly legitimate to go, yeah, it looks like this. Like you do whatever means necessary to overthrow the old uh, aristocratic hierarchy, to overthrow, um, you know, a, a ecclesiastical privilege, uh, blah, 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 stuff you might read in Voltaire. Um, what's not plausible, and this is the reason I mention all these details, is it is not possible that the Alta Vendita constitutes an organized, sustained, century-long document or plot or, or organizing do, um, uh, um, constitution that directed a bunch of other people to do something. It was never circulated like that. It was never known like that. Uh, and uh, I think by the middle of the century, the only people that knew about it anymore were Catholics. Uh so if you so that's that's the ambiguity. Are you telling me that this stuff about the Carbonari, uh, about the Alta Vendita, are you telling me that this is um, ideologically a good example of what these different kinds of people were into? You know, is, are, are you like showing me? I don't know. I don't, the HBO Sopranos and going. This is what twenty percent of men were into in two thousand one. Is that what you're telling me? Okay, that's fine. Or are you telling me this is some kind of constitutional or foundational document that people were reading for a century and operating under or was that some agent was operating off of and executed over the course of a century? Which one are you telling me? The first one's plausible, but won't establish what Marshall wants to establish, which is a causal narrative about a plot through history that stretches over a hundred years. The second one is substantial and would establish causation, namely, here's all these actors, they're all acting out uh, this document and trying to bring it into execution, but you don't have the evidence, which would namely, okay, show me that people were interacting, reading this, and then executing a plan from it. 
That's the problem. And on top of that, if you want to take the second reading, it's not going to work. It's not going to be plausible because why? Marshall not only doesn't have enough evidence, but he's got a view of Freemasonry that's not even accurate. He has no idea of the complexity of these secret societies. He's got no idea of their primary sources. He's got no idea that Freemasons make up myths and crap and lies all the time. Uh, he's got no idea that the Carbonari are opposed to the Freemasons. And so he can't plausibly have a narrative like that. And so the only narrative he can plausibly be have is just a set of um, uh, comparisons of ideologies, a set of comparisons of ideas. But guess what? That's not a historical narrative. That's not a good, that's not a story that establishes anything that won't show the plot, which is the problem. I want to see the plot. How did X cause Y to be Z? If you can't do that for me, which is what you're supposed to be establishing, then it's over. The whole story has gone. You've just shown me a bunch of bad guys that think alike. Well, we knew that. It's called the Enlightenment. There's a book. There's an introduction. Very short introduction to the Enlightenment could have gotten me all of that without the Freemason stuff. Done. I know. Duh. Obviously. So I don't get it. I don't get the point of this focus on Freemasons. What's it do for us? What's it do for us that uh, a very short uh, introduction to the Enlightenment by Oxford Press doesn't get you? Nothing, as far as I can tell. Uh, did anybody want to? Like, Kevin, do you want to talk about this at, at, at briefly? No, well, I think to kind of summarize what you're saying, because I'm, I'm watching the chat and I'm seeing people talking, you know, basically what, what you're saying is it's abs it's implausible because we've got these two competing different scenarios and no one has provided proof that this long, this long, uh, this design that they, that the Carbonari had given, that people were actually there to carry it out over the course of the next 130, 140 years or so. That's essentially in a, in a nutshell what I'm hearing you say. And I think it's a good question. And in the context of Marshall's book, um, there's no, again, this is where, if it's true that there is this connection, as you say, where's the plot? What's the connection that doesn't show you here? Like, okay, so we talk about, for instance, like Belladad. Well, can you connect Belladad to Freemasonry? Can you connect her to the Alta Vendita and the Cabanat? She was, she was Italian, uh, but that's circumstantial. Uh, so it, it's, I mean, you've done a little bit more work on this than, uh, admittedly, than, than what, and you raised some really good questions, but the only thing that I could really do is just kind of chime in and say, yeah, on this point to say, yeah, I think that there's no direct line. There's no continuity is what I think you're trying to say. Well, show me the continuity. No, zero. In fact, there's no even, there's not even any continuity between the Alta Vendita, the small group of people that were circulating those letters, which if I recall is, uh, from, from one uh, critical review on this was probably about 40, 50 people and the rest of the Carbonari. Like it's not even clear that the rest of the Carbonari thought like this, except in the common sense way where you go, hey, if I want to overthrow an organization, what can I do? Well, I can go hit them over the head with a club, uh, but uh, that's not going to work out because they have the military. So what can I do? Uh, I can change their mind uh, and then slowly uh, work to get influence and then change everybody else's mind. Well, neat. That's not a, that's not a, a, the fast. That's not a very fascinating story. Um, not put like this anyway. That doesn't appear to be the story Marshall's telling. So, you know, let me know. Uh, if it's just intellectual history, uh, he could have done it very differently. Um, Michael, did you want to talk about Freemasons? Because I want to I want to move on. No, I, th I think y'all summarized it well, really well. Um, and, and I know we're already at two hours, but it's perfectly fine to continue. Um, I know we have a lot of ground to cover. So, yeah, go, go ahead and move forward. That's fine. Okay, let me see. Let me get my let me get my thing. So and I want to have a, a sort of brief, again, reflection on. What so this is this is this oh, the meta the meta consideration let's say Freemasonry versus the Freemasonic. So sometimes Taylor Marshall, especially in videos where he talks about his critics, will talk about um, the Freemasonic, and sometimes he will talk about Freemasonry. Free the Freemasonic just means I guess stuff that's akin to Freemasonry, and then Freemasonry uh, is the, the group of people. So wh which one? Um, if, you're, if you're just telling me about ideas and thoughts that are like things that Freemasons would have hold, held, then this needs to be intellectual history. But instead, you gave me sociopolitical history, how this group connects to this group and influences this group. But those are two very different stories. And if you can't distinguish the two, then you don't 
even, first of all, intellectual history doesn't even have a plot except to say that one idea came after another. And sometimes you can, you can trace a, um, a, a school of ideas, uh, but that's not the point of intellectual history. Intellectual history is always to, to uh, exhibit the ideas and then sort of show um, you know, their sociological connections but, and to show the transformation of ideas over time. But they're not, the ideas don't cause one. Ideas don't bump into other ideas and make them do stuff. People bump into other people uh, and talk to other people and interact with other people and uh, convince and persuade other people. And then they change their mind and hold different ideas. So uh, that, that'll always be the causal underpinning of an intellectual history. But intellectual history is about a relation of ideas and their transformation over time, which is not the book that Marshall wrote. Marshall wrote what appears to be a, socio a socio-political history, which is to say this group did this group, did this thing with this thing, and they interacted this way, and that produced this. Fine. But then you can't shift to the Freemasonic. You have to go from this group of guys who are Freemasons did this with these guys. That's the problem. And it's it's a back and forth. So it's, it's, it's the Martin Bailey, on top of being the reification fallacy where you confuse... Um, the abstract with the concrete, when you make abstract ideas things, it's a it's a Martin Bailey problem. Martin Bailey fallacies when you so you've got to defend this idea, and what do you say? Well, you say, look, I'll give you criticism. Look, you don't have any evidence that these groups interacted around this document to produce this result. You have zero evidence, and you in fact have contravening evidence. That's um. Uh, that's that's the and and so the opponent will retreat and go, oh, I just mean that uh, a bunch of different guys uh, shared a Freemasonic ideology, and that's the connection, and that's all I'm talking about. Uh, and since you don't understand that and you don't realize what I'm talking about, therefore you're wrong. And he, I've seen him do this a bunch of times, and I saw Timothy Flanders do this in the defense where he goes, oh, this is just a, 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 an introduction to the ideological, you know, to, to, to ideas and how they influence the situation we're in in the church. No, it isn't. You told me it was a plot in your own, you told me, it's a, you told me it was a, a set of actions by people that established this event. You didn't tell me it was uh, a history of ideas. And you, you, so you can't get on top of me when I say you didn't show me the real history that you claim to be having and say, oh, no, it was just about ideas and thoughts and uh, abstractions all along. That's not going to work. That's not legitimate. That's um, inappropriate. And on top of that, it leads to a vice. Namely, among traditionalists, it leads to try to find the Mason in any event. Now, sometimes there is one, uh, but so what's, what's the problem? So first of all, you'll try to find the Mason. If you can find one, great. If you can't find one, you find a guy that has the idea. Uh, an idea that looks Freemasonic and you say he's probably a Mason or working with the Masons. And then you make this historical story about how this guy interacted with this guy, interacted with this guy, interacted with this guy to make this result happen. That's why that guy's a bad guy and corrupted whatever he was involved in. And that isn't going to work. That causes a lot of problems. That causes the Bunini and the liturgy problem. That causes the Vatican II problem. That causes, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, any time where the, the, the Pope makes uh, or, or the church makes an action and you've got your Mason, your villain, involved in the events, you say that he must have been working on the plot to make those bad. Why? Because you're going to say you're going to go to the the strong argument, which is, oh, he's he's got to be involved in this organization that's called, trying to bring this about. Um, and then when you retreat to the ideological um, uh, defense, you just leave the narrative in place. You retreat to the ideological defense and say, oh, you're wrong. You don't get that. I'm just talking about ideas. But then you don't recognize that if you're just talking about ideas, then you can't show that a guy that holds some of those ideas necessarily would have tried to um, destroy what you're working on. Why, and why is that obvious? Because let's say I hold certain economic ideas and I'm on a bureaucratic board with people and, uh, uh, and I'm working with them on a common project and I have certain ideas about, I don't know, the general distribution of wealth in society, but I can't get them done in, in, in that group. Then I'll go, well, 
I can't get everything I want, but I'll compromise and get some things and, you know, I'll add my voice to this. And why would you say that? Because you're not part of an organization that's trying to bring about a, a, a conclusion. You just have some ideas and people can hold multiple ideas. People can hold conflicting ideas. Sometimes your ideas can be Freemasonic. Sometimes your ideas can be modernist. Sometimes your ideas can be orthodox. Sometimes your ideas can be you know, anti-Masonic. People can hold a whole cacophony of ideas or have actions that are conflicting in character all the time. So it's weak to say somebody has Freemasonic thinking. It's strong to say they're involved in a group that's attempting to execute an agenda. And those are very different in the, in what they'll, uh, what they'll prove. Because if all you can say is, um, let's, let's just say it's just Bunini reforming the literature and it isn't. But uh, let's say um, you've got Bunini and all you can say is he's got Freemasonic ideas. So what? He might have other ideas. So what? Some of his ideas might be Freemasonic. Some might not be. That doesn't show anything. Um, but if you want to say, oh, he's working with the Masons and the Masons as a group at that time in 1969 were working on a project, which I can show, to destroy the liturgy and render it satanic or whatever you want. And therefore, he's probably an agent to try to accomplish that goal. That's a strong argument, but it requires a lot of evidence. And he, he, it's not there. And every time we come to something like this, it ain't there. Like you can't move from guys who have communistic ideas to communist plots being fulfilled. That doesn't work. That's the issue. All right. That's the end on the section. The next section would be on uh, Lady of La Salette, Fatima, and the St. Michael prayer, which would be Kevin's wheelhouse. <laughs> wow. How do you follow that act? <laughs> um. Well, again, I just I want to reiterate. Um, I understand River River the point that you're making about you know the, the connections, and I I I get the philosophy and the the, the causal stuff that you're talking about. But you know it, it 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 is a fact that Bunini was a Freemason and he was taking orders from them. Right, and, and that's just an it, example. The Bunini, the Bunini briefcase story is true. You know that that's and that's why he got booted over to Iran. You know, we, we have names now. We've got more of the story. The, the guy who was helping Archbishop Edward Gagnon with the apostolic visitation of the Roman Curia has come forward and has said, nope, it's all true. I helped him with the paperwork, you know. Right, right, right. And and we'll have sec time later to discuss the, the Bonini case in particular, but that's just a template because the, the, pro the, the problem is the general problem. Namely, you can't move from guy has X kind of ideas to guy is executing a plot for an organization. That's not good enough. You have to show me, which is what you're gonna talk about. You have to show me that you can demonstrate community involvement with X group and that X group has such and such ends that would make it plausible that this person uh, is trying to execute those ends. That's what you have to show. And you can't do no, that. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. You're, you're exactly. So that's why, like, as I as I'm basically what you're saying is, as this has been argued, dare I say, traditionally, it doesn't work. But we have some new considerations. So let's look at that and kind of just put the rest of it aside. That's right. kind of how I'm reading you right, right. now. And that's a, that's fair. That's fair. Right. I, I just want to be very clear on that. But with respect to uh, you know the stuff with you know the private revelation angle, you know. In the context of infiltration, Marshall comes across as using it as, dare I say, as a crutch. Um, he wants to, he can't just, he doesn't show that causality. He doesn't show all of the research. So instead, the practical effect of what he does by leaning on private revelation and interpreting it as he does is to prop up an otherwise weak argument. He hasn't shown what you said. But oh wait no I've got the authority of God said, and I have here I have to do honor to my friend who went to God five years ago Richard Salvato. He he was the one who explained this idea. He's like in private revelation, people use the authority of God said, yeah. and it's like the Deus ex machina, and that I've dealt with this consistently and in recent years, and it's intensely aggravating. Um, but this is this is the practical effect that happens in Marshall's book. It, it's it's it, it it spins for a nice story when it comes to things like 
you know, what Our Lady said about the Rome losing the faith and becoming the seat of Antichrist. Well, here's the thing. Rome does not mean the Vatican. Rome could be interpreted as the city of Rome, which that happened in 1870 when, it, when papal Rome fell. Right. So the, if Our Lady said those words, congratulations, the prophecies fulfilled 151 years ago now, something like that. Where do we go from here? You know, it, 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 it doesn't, you know, but the, the secrets, the, the secret of La Salette can be easily abused. And I can honestly say that there is some research uh, that is being done on the question of the diff of the the two versions of the secret. I'm not allowed to go any further than that. Uh, I might have pushed. I went. I just walked up to a line there. But there is some research being done um, on the question on this matter by a priest uh, that, whom I know. Um, so I'm hoping to get some clarity on that. I'm not as familiar with the historical developments of La Salette as I am the others. But uh, Michael Loft, I think you mentioned earlier about how it was placed on the, the secret, the second one, the longer one, was placed on the index of forbidden books. Yes, that is true. There's been some challenge and some issues to that that I'm not all too familiar with. But yes, there is there is some questions about that. And let's call uh, to mind, and we've talked about this. We've uh, he, Marshall treats the longer La Salette. And I don't want to misrepresent him, but this is my impression. This was the impression of most of the reviewers I read that talked about it. He treats the, the longer and restricted version as if it had the same authority of the other. And that's not true. That's not how uh, the theology of private revelation works in the church. And on top of that, his only defense I've heard him make about it is, well, if you say that um, you know, the one was not acceptable, but the other one was. You say that she's a lying prophetess, and um, therefore the whole thing's invalid. But if that's true, then the you then you can't then the the the, the Rome couldn't have uh, approved any of it. But that's not right. That's not how magisterium on uh, on uh, revelation works at all. Well, so, well, with respect to private revelations, the church does not involve the the, the church has no infallibility. That it, that does not uh, affect that area. So either in prudential judgments or the actual decision of something approved or not, there could be mistakes made. But having said that, though, um, the question of the secret of La Salette, what it really comes down to is, is this second text, the longer one, credible? Can we believe it? Does it represent what the Lady of La Salette actually said? As far as I know, the jury's still out on that. So if Marshall wants to sit there and say something like, I believe that it's authentic, that's great, Dr. Marshall, but then you better darn well back up point by point why you think this is. And I don't really feel as though, I, I don't, not even feel, I don't think he does a good job of it in infiltration showing that. He talks about the, uh, the I think it was a Dominican, Michel de Courteville, uh, who, who, uh, who under the direction of uh, Father René Laurentin, the famous French Mariologist, uh, found the document in the Vatican archives and they had this presser on it. It was this big to do. And but I'm going to reveal something. This is I. This may be an exclusive for reason and theology. So if anybody wants to know this, they have to come here for this. Um, that angered uh, uh, Jean Stern, who is one of the preeminent uh, uh, authorities on La Salette. When when Laurentin pulled that stunt with Courtville. They made it sound like we knew all, like this is all fresh and brand new, et cetera. Well, Jean Stern, publicly, during a, uh, a scholarly presentation, some uh, I can't remember when, I'd have to check it again, but he actually challenged publicly in the context of this, of this, of this um, uh, conference. It was like a Mariological conference or something like that. Uh, they, he, he's challenged him and said, what were you thinking? Like, how dare you? Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He's like, do, he's like, you made this sound to be like this whole new thing, Father Laurentin. This was irresponsible. This is we already know all of this stuff. This has all been worked out. You're just creating sensationalism. These are th th these sorts of things were being indicated in the context of this uh, of this thing. And I know because I spoke with one of the Mariologists who was in the room when it happened. So I'm not of liberty to say who. But I, I, you know, this is what happened. So it's not settled. I say the story because it's not settled, you know, uh, the, uh, about the history of some of these things. And that's why I look forward to some genuine scholarly work being done on it. And this priest that I know who's working on this, this, uh, some of this work, 
Uh, he is writing it in French. He, he, he is a French priest and he's working on it. I do look forward to, to his take on it. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I would agree with everything, but I think that there needs to be some fresh look at this because it's been now 100 years into this and we've had all this controversy over it. So the, the, walk, the takeaway is it's not settled. We can hold a private opinion, but to base a whole thing upon it like Marshall does here in Infiltration, I think is a bit questionable. Now, that's with respect to La Select. Yeah, so what about the St. Michael prayer story and how Marshall uses that? Because I know you've done a lot of work on this. Oh, he's he totally abuses it. He, he totally abuses it. So what are what are what are his issues? What are his issues? Well, he, he gets things wrong. He misspeaks on things. So, for instance, uh, chapter five begins on page thirty-three of the first edition, first print, um, right uh, right at the beginning, first few lines. The reason for the additions to the Holy Mass, meaning the Leonine prayer, the prayers after Mass, is the topic of a conspiracy theory. Right there, right at the beginning paragraph of this chapter. No, they weren't additions to the Holy Mass. They were known as the Erationes Postmissam for a reason, the prayers after Mass. They never made it into the Missal. So that's an inexactitude that demonstrates someone wasn't careful. Moving on, uh, the, the, the prayer, the 1859 prayer that after Mass that Pius IX, Blessed Pius IX instituted, had four different prayers after after the mass, uh, so, uh, that, that from different masses, um, like the mass of Blessed Virgin Mary, mass for the remission of sins, mass for peace, and mass for enemies. Uh, he took four different colics from that mass and had those inserted with, the, with these prayers in 1859, which, by the way, was one of my observations. Um, and, uh, at least I talked about it in my book. Then I'm moving on page 34. He says. Pope Leo the Thirteenth mystically observed an apparition. If you're look, if you're seeing an apparition, you're not mystically observing an apparition. This is a mystical event. Period. <laughs> you know. So the phrasing is awkward. Um, again, we come back to that question of how he uses language in his eighteen eighty six encyclical Quad Multum. Uh, Leo the Thirteenth refers to this infiltrating work. Uh, well, and he quotes. It is enough to recall rationalism and naturalism, those deadly sources of evil whose teachings are everywhere freely distributed. We must then add the many allurements to corruption, the opposition to or open defection from the church by public officials, the bold obstinacy of secret societies, here and there a curriculum for the education of youth without regard for God. Now here he does have a footnote, um, though he doesn't tell you where, the, where he's getting the English translation from. Well, the problem is, is this is not infiltration by deception. He's quoting Leo saying, it's open. This isn't deception. This is open. It's being done in the open. How is that deception? You know, so he's not even paying attention to what Leo himself is saying. Um, then, uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll just like move on to that. Uh, page 37, he says, Critic, when he's talking about one of the legends that, that came out from Monsignor, Monsignor Karl Vogel in Germany, Page 37, he says, critics point out that Monsignor Vogel's account in 1931 is 45 years removed from Leo's composition of the prayer to St. Michael and his inclusion of it, etc. Who? Where? He doesn't tell us. Who are these critics? Um, then he says, then he starts talking about Cardinal Nassali, who knew Leo's personal secretary, Monsignore Rinaldo Angeli, who heard Leo talk about the vision. And Rinaldi told different people, including uh, uh, Cardinal Nassali, the, well, the future Cardinal Nassali. Uh, uh, Marshall says, nevertheless, a certain Cardinal Giovanni Battista Nassali Rocco de Cuneliano, 1872 to 1952, testified that he had repeatedly received precisely the same story from Pope Leo XIII's personal secretary, Monsignore Rinaldo Angeli, 1851 to 1914. Well, no. Okay. I, I, I've, I've, tra I've translated uh, the, the text from I, I, in my book, like, no, Marshall was wrong. Uh, Nassali doesn't say that he heard it many times from Nassali, uh, from, from, from Monsignor Angeli. He says that Angeli shared it numerous times with different people. There's a slight difference. So again, just, just really, just inexactitudes, impreciseness. Um, he says that, 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 that uh, Nassali was the Pope's secretary. No, he wasn't. 
Anjali was the secretary. So this looks like it was written in a hurry, and it just it it you know it it it, it just doesn't work. It, it it doesn't work. Now these are all these little inexactitudes, and there's more I could point out now, but I'll 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 just we, we should probably jump ahead. Um, but yeah, it, it's these little inexactitudes. So if we're looking at the historical value, like when you talk about you know right, I mean if, if, if people, because- he's not even getting that right. Yeah, because like here's the, here's the thing, and I, I want to make this clear because how does this connect to, to what I'm talking about in the general picture? Because like, okay, so you want to tell me that there's a plot. If there's a plot of and it's a set of specific events, then the writing needs to be precise and it needs to show how those events developed and connected and mm-hmm. led to one another. Now, if you're just going to tell me, um, oh, no, well, I just sort of want to show you like, you know, how to the church's thinking changed over time and I, the you know the loose the the loose transformation of ideas and c- circumstances. Well, why do you need all these details anyway? What what's what's the point of all this apparatus? That's 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 the issue. So either you've got an intellectual and ideological history that has too much stuff in it and is not very clear at all. Because, I mean, just just meditating on some vision that Leo the Thirteenth had, or saw, or whatever. Um, and not illustrating sort of all the ideas in that in a, in a long way and how those contrast with before and transform things after um, that uh, that doesn't help uh, that doesn't help at all that I, I need a bigger picture if you're doing ideological and intellectual history but mm-hmm. if you're doing social history then this this is all incoherent I mean it's it's, it's bad details it's bad development and it's non it's not particularly causal so which is it I, I want to know I want to know what I'm supposed to get from this because as it is, it just looks like a rough outline of some ideas that you think are reflected in this event. Uh, and then, uh, you know, scandal, scandal, scandal. And, uh, Oh, I know that trads love, um, the, I lo- I know that trads love the St. Michael prayer. So let's tell that story so that we can get their eyes on it. That's all I get. I, I don't understand what the point is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, you know, it, it... I, I, I kind of see the prompt here. Um, you know, we're gonna, I, we're probably gonna have to. There's a lot that goes into all of that. Uh, and and I, I suppose, did you like? If you uh, we need to split for part two because this has gone on way beyond what we what we what we thought about. <laughs> but uh, like, do you? I'm sure you think that there's a lot of moving parts on Fatima, right? Oh, yeah. Let's. So yeah, there's too, <laughs> there's too there's too many moving parts on Fatima. So I say we split this into another part and we go ahead and do Q&A so that the audience can re-engage and so that we can help people sort of where they're at come to where we are so that we can set up for, because though this is a, this is a moral point and an intellectual point. And if, if nobody follows it, then we, we could have just chatted around brunch. So um, let's, let's, I think we ought to go to the audience, Michael, and then come back at a next week or the week after or something. Yeah, that's good with me. If y'all want to send some <clears throat> questions there, make sure to send it to at reason and theology. Here's one. Uh, what should we think about the so-called sunk Gallen mafia? What do y'all think? Um, I'll, I'll spoil it. And I'll say that, I mean, you know, first of all, this was a joking thing that these, I guess, ostensibly, probably liberal prelates. I don't know. When we get there, we get there. Uh, we can talk about it. This is a joking label that they called themselves. Why? Because they basically had brunch and got together and, you know, talked about where they wanted things to go. If you, you know, it's dramatic and a nice title. Fine. Um, uh, what what to think about them? I mean, I don't know. There's interest groups in the church. Uh, did they get their way? Uh, not clearly. It's not even clear that they got their way with Francis. It was a little, it, when the Amazon Synod wasn't decided yet, when uh, church, after Morris Letizia, church practice looked under threat, uh, you know, it looked a little more different when, you know, it, it didn't look like, you know, it would look like Francis might give in on women things or on gay things. It looked a little different. It doesn't look the same now. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I don't like a lot of those prelates for a lot of reasons, but you're always going to have that. I mean, you had that in Trent. So, what do you want? Um, that's my opinion. Uh, but we could we'll talk about that on part two, I think. What was the question again? I'm, I'm sorry. What, what to should, think? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. What, what what should we make of the Saint uh, Gallen Mafia? Yeah. I, I would just chime in and keep it very simple. 
we know that it, that it, that it was a thing. It's been admitted publicly, um, and but what exactly it did, how it operated, what kind of cloak and dagger stuff, you know, it makes for good like Dan Brown kind of novels. But we have to stick to the facts. Uh, River, you made a really good point. I think it was in the Skill of X episode about this point. You know, don't go with the narrative. Go with the facts. What do the facts tell us? Right now, we know very, very little. Um, and we may never know. We're, we're too close to these events. We are way too close to these events. And we have to be careful with how we speak of them because we don't want to look like the conspiracy, like QAnon kind of stuff. Yes, I just said QAnon. Uh, uh, but because yeah, you, you look crazy. Yeah, I, I tried to look into it and like what? Okay, yes, just some of these prelates hold opinions I don't like. Um, and some don't, obviously. And they got together and had brunch, basically, uh, a number of times. And they're like-minded on some things, so they all have the same idea. They all have this plot to... Like, it, clearly, Marshall's model is... They got together. They've got a very organized agenda, and we can lay it out. And it's like uh, this, this, um, like you know, sexual revolution stuff. And it's this, um, you know, uh, you know, this uh, like very liberal stuff. And it's you know, change all the teachings of the church, and um, you know, weird, you know, just distort doctrine to whatever you want stuff. Maybe that's true, uh, and maybe some people hold those ideas, but that doesn't show that that's really what they're working on. And it certainly doesn't show that just because they elected Pope Francis, now Pope Francis is doing that. So I, I need a lot more. I mean, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to get me information from the meetings or you're gonna have to get me information from the particular people and their reflections on the meetings. And then you you probably need to gonna need to connect that to Pope Francis himself. I mean, we have, this is what really buzzed, we have biographical information on S S Pope Francis. It's, he's, he's got a record going back however many years and you, can show this. So if like, and most of these people don't have a problem talking about their problematic opinions. So like, what is Pope Francis like secret crypto hiding everything? No, that's dumb. He's been acting this way all this time. Uh, so go ahead and connect it to his biography and show me from those sources, how this and this connects and how they had a meeting and how they agree. And this is what Francis is going to do. Show me that. That would be great. I'd love that. But that doesn't exist. And I know it doesn't exist because Taylor didn't have it. And if he had it, he would have put it in the book. Period. It's not hard. It's not confusing. It just, um, yeah. it's just all, kind of all that it is is circumstantial with the St. Gallen Mafia, like with Theodore McCarrick and whatnot. And that's why you have to be careful. This is one of the dangers with Marshall. Things, it's so circumstantial that he can hide behind it. And so if something comes up that affirms at least on its face, something that was said, you know, you have to be careful. Like, for instance, last year when I when I revealed what Father Brian Harrison told me about Bonini and the briefcase story from Michael Davies, Marshall, all he did, he never mentioned me by name, but what he did was he just simply just a little retweeted it, you know, and, uh, you know, because somebody, somebody, he retweeted, he retweeted somebody's thinking. So in other words, you know, Marshall's thesis was correct. It's like, no, it's not Marshall's thesis. He took that from other people. <laughs> Um, you know, but, but like this, so it looks like you have to be very careful with how you approach these things. And when I wrote that review last year, I suspected that was going to happen. Um, but it needed to be said anyway, because again, so that's why you have to be very careful. Something may come up that can well, demonstrate authenticity and make him look good. You have to be careful with that. With well, I mean, we're all very, we're all very careful here at reason and theology and, and nuance. Um, but what, what I, I like, I want to. What's what's illustrative for me is are these little things where this jump happened. So, like, you could take, for instance, this was a this was a big one for them, and I think the audience will understand this. Remember when James Martin and Pope Francis had a meeting, and everybody yeah. got upset. And what was this supposed to demonstrate? I, 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 you know, this was supposed to demonstrate that the Holy Father agrees with all. What is it? I don't know. The Holy Father agrees with all of James Martin's ideas or promotes everything James Martin says or they're in cahoots and they're going to have a, you know, a group discussion to enact 
a, a plot to, you know, make whatever, whatever. Well, that looks pretty dumb now because uh, James Martin is on Twitter, uh, you know, having a, a, a meltdown and crying over the CDF statement that the Holy Father approved. So um, clearly the mere association of these two people and maybe the fact that it doesn't demonstrate a, a total commonality of ideas. And uh, from all of our evidence, uh, it looks like the only thing they really agree with is the idea of building bridges. But does that mean that the Holy Father now thinks that um, every homosexual, everything that uh, James Martin thinks is great, is he thinks the same? No, it doesn't mean that. You're going to have to give me more. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing with the St. Gallen Mafia. Just this guy has these views and this guy has these views, but does everybody have those views? And did they all get together to make sure that a Pope had all those views? I don't know. Show it to me. Show it. Prove it. You can't. The end. That's the problem. That's the <clears throat> You know what? Honestly, it kind of reminds me of... <laughs> Something we've we've done on the show before with ancient aliens. We go yeah. over some of their videos, <laughs> and, we, and we'll show how. What the, you know, the does argument this, is. Does it's, this it, mean? It's built does on. This mean? Well, it, it's built on. Well, there's an assumption here, and then you're gonna base you know an argument on that, and then you're gonna also base another assumption on that assumption and then another assumption on that assumption and then come to a conclusion and it's based on so many assumptions that are built on each other that it just seems extremely hard to uh maintain it and very yeah very dubious so it, it kind of reminds me of what i tend to see in in some of these circles with some of these individuals and their arguments it's they, they assume something and then they speculate further and then they make another assumption and they build on top of it and then they draw a conclusion based on all of it. And Pope, Pope Francis was yeah. in the same room as Taylor Marshall, who is in the same country as New Mexico where the Roswell UFO crashed and therefore... Could maybe Saint Pope Francis be an alien? Ancient Nine alien theorists say yes. Yeah. Okay, it's the same okay. stuff over and over. <laughs> okay, more, let's get some more questions. Let's let's get to this one from the Caswit. Was Bunini really a Freemason? If so, what evidence is there he was actually a Freemason? Well, well, that that'll be a part two topic. But Ke uh, Kevin, answer in brief because Kevin thinks Kevin thinks so. Kevin thinks he's got. Better yes. evidence than Marshall. Um, Taylor Marsh, I mean, um, Archbishop Annabelle Bonini was indeed a Freemason. Uh, and I'm very clear, this, my source for this is um, Father Charles Murr. He was this personal secretary to Edward Cardinal Gagnon. Wait, was it, was it, was it, he's a Freemason or was it at least involved in free, with Freemasons? I couldn't remember. I, I clarified about. that with Father Murr just the other day and he okay. said, no. He was a Freemason. Okay. Um, Archb uh, then Archbishop Edward Gagnon, later Cardinal Gagnon, Father Murr was the personal secretary to Gagnon. Well, who was Gagnon? He was personally appointed by Pope Paul VI to be um, the, uh, the apostolic visitator to the Roman Curia. So in other words, kind of like an audit, if you will, of the Roman Curia. And the specific reason for that apostolic visitation was because Archbishop later Cardinal Benelli was asked by the Pope, is the situation within the Curia that serious where I should do something like this? And Benelli took about a month, Father Murray told me, and got back to the Pope and said, yes, your holiness, it is. And I've got just the man to do it. Gagnon comes on the scene. Father Murray was studying in Rome and he made the, he made the acquaintance of Gagnon and he eventually, he became uh, Gagnon's driver he, uh, he was a secretary and he helped him with the documents during the, like he was in the room when Gagnon was going through and studying the documents. And Father Murr has unabashedly come out and said, nope, Bunini was a Freemason. And I know this because I worked with Gagnon and my mentor in the Roman Curia was Mario Marini, Monsignore Mario Marini, who was in the room when Bunini's fate was decided to go Exile to be an exile to, to, to the new uh, as a nuncio to Iran, uh, and it and it was because they discovered 
that uh, the, the Bonini briefcase that had all these documents indicating that he was doing stuff that he should not have been. Dino mm -hmm. Cardinal Staffa, then the head of the Apostolical Signatura, the highest church court uh, in the church, was involved in bringing the documents to Pope Paul VI's attention. And they had been authenticated by the Roman Carabinieri, the Roman police, uh, mm -hmm. beforehand. So, yes, it was very serious. This was about right. the mid-70s. And let's uh, let's save most of it for next time. But uh, Kevin thinks so. And uh, if if uh, you know, and this is the thing about I, I had a very different opinion. Um, uh, I kind of thought it was a bunch of James Bond stuff. But the, if if Kevin's given me good reason to at least believe it's plausible, and I sh and I'm going to change my mind on it. And that's the point. Uh, you know, if Marshall would give me as good as good a stuff as Kevin gives me, I change my mind. But he doesn't. Well, I, I, if I may add one quick thing. I want, I'd like to reveal this tonight. Um, Michael Davies knew the name of the priest who found the briefcase, but Davies would not re reveal it because well, of what would happen to that priest. But also, I spoke with one of Davies' friends not too long ago, Michael Davies' friends, and uh, Davies was the second president of Univoce International, by the way, which is a big traditional organization. And uh, long story short, Bunini threatened to sue Michael Davies, if Davies mm. would not shut up. And I have this on the authority of one of Davies' friends who heard it direct from Davies. Davies died uh, 17 years ago. So, of course, you know, he, he, he can't go to him, but his friends are still alive, many of them. And uh, his friend did tell me, I'm not permitted to reveal the name of the friend at this time because this, this person has children and doesn't want to cause trouble uh, on that level. But uh, I can tell you that, yes, Bonini threatened to sue. Uh, Michael Davies, if Davies would not stop talking about it. All right. Uh, did we do we have any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> um, this one is from Will. Question for Simmons. Did Lacarro and Bonini have a conflict of interest in committee? And if so, uh, who do you think won? I'd have to look at the, you know, actually, Father Murray would probably be the better. Will knows Father Murray. Uh, Will my uh, Father Murray might be the better person on that, um, but I do know that Bunini held a pretty strong influence on the Concilium, uh, which was the commission to established to implement Sacrosanctum Concilium uh, from Vatican II, the liturgical reforms. And uh, we know that Bunini was up to some shenanigans there. Father Louis Bouillet, who was a member of the Concilium, talked about it during, uh, in his memoirs and also made a comment. Uh, uh, during a, a talk that he had given, I don't have all the sources in front of me at the moment, but um, but in it, 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 like Bunini, like the Concilium would say X to to Bunini, Bunini would then go to the Pope, allegedly in the name of the Concilium, and tell the Pope something different, and Pope Paul VI would say something Bunini to tell the Concilium, and then Bunini would come back and tell, say something different to the Concilium. Well, finally. Father Louis Bouillet was like, I don't get it. This is mixing what? So he asked to have a private audience with Pope Paul VI, and he and it was granted. And Father Bouillet was like, we don't understand this. And he's like, what are you talking about? And, like, and Father was like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, I told Monsignore Bunini this. And 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 Bouillet was like, what? Are you, what? Like, we told him. And that's when we found, that's when they had like this big kind of like, oh, my goodness, something's wrong here. Um so there was some there was some funny business, and Bonini himself admitted that somewhere in his biography, I don't know where I put it, but uh, he admitted that they had an agenda, but they didn't want to be too, shall we say, progressive about it up front because it would raise too many eyebrows. Uh, his a recent biographer of Bonini, Yves Chiron, uh, put that in the book, and it's available in English. Uh, this one is from Andrew. Uh, we are we doing the Fatima stuff next time? He was on the kick of that last summer. Yeah, Fatima will take too long, so we'll we'll we should do it in the next part because if there's a lot of moving parts in that, there's no way we could do it right now. Yeah, yeah. I presume you say he was on a kick at Marshall. I yeah, presume. right, right. Yeah, he was a he was on a kick on that. I had the unfortunate thing of people blowing up my phone. Did you see this? No, stop. <laughs> At one point, I, I know the feeling. Ferrara. I know the feeling. I, I debated Ferrara uh, for three and a half years ago on the third part of Secret of Fatima. So, and, and I just I sat there. And I was I was on the exercise machine, 
at the at the gym and I was listening to it and I was just I was just I'm like, oh my goodness, please just stop before you hurt yourselves. Just stop. <laughs> More of that in the next meeting. <laughs> Look, gentlemen, I want to thank y'all for coming on and doing this. I know your time is is precious, so I really appreciate y'all doing this. And I know y'all also put a lot of time into preparing this content. So I really want to thank y'all for it. Thank you, Michael. And, you know, I, I'd be happy to, like I said, do a part two. We can discuss off the air maybe some dates for that. But uh, I think that would be extremely helpful. Yeah, and I'm, I'm hyped for we got so much more to do. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's been fun research for me. Kevin, your first show, but hey, welcome on anytime. I look forward to doing a part two, like I said. Well, thank you very much. You know, I, it's been a pleasure. And if I may, you know, I don't know if, you know, Dr. Marshall will ever see this, but I just want to be clear. No animus. I just want to, I, but I would like to talk to him. So if, if, he, if he's watching this, like I, I, you know, he has my information. I would love to talk to him privately. You know. And and yeah, same thing. Like again, I want to make very clear. Like I have used Marshall's material, the old stuff, from time to time. Uh, I find many. Of the, I even find in infiltration, he he occasionally has interesting stuff to say. Especially the last chapter, his his theological reflections are really interesting. And I think he's a sincere, nice guy. I just I don't. Uh, you know, if you want to do scholarship, do scholarship. If you don't want to do scholarship and you wanted to do homilies, do homilies. If you wanted to do intellectual history and not political history, do intellectual history. Like, I don't, what are we doing? So, like, you know, be, you know, and I think he, you know, I don't, I think he has goodwill. And I think that he, yeah, everybody agrees that we're in a crisis. I'm not naive, but I, I, you know, we don't, you know, as I always say, we don't need to be on story time when we talk about serious things. We need to be on fact time. When we talk yeah, about um, serious things, you know, I I agree. I get the impression that Doctor Marshall, I, I I don't really know him, but I get the impression he's sincere and he's of goodwill, and so I I don't question any of that. I'm I'm more concerned just about what he's saying and the solutions that he offers. I think those tend to be sometimes problematic, not always, just some some of them tend to be problematic. So that's kind of where I I try to keep it when it comes to. Dr. Marshall, I, I haven't seen any reason to question his motives or anything like that. So. Okay, River, River's River got the cat, and the cat's going to steal the show. So I, have to, <laughs> yeah. so I, I have to ask, what is up with this uh, certain Italian food that keeps getting brought up in the chat? Oh, I was uh, trying to figure that out, yeah, too. Everybody wanted me to. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, yeah Q&A Q Q to the audience. Why? Oh, yeah, be, lasagna. I, but I why, think, uh, why, why is everybody bringing up? lasagna I, I think they were wanting me to say i love lasagna or something like that I, and i don't know yeah why. is it like an inside joke or something i have no idea either? what it is i don't know i okay. think they wanted to just hear my accent on display or something uh, I, so I was thinking of obliging <laughs> but i was like i don't know if i should you know yeah they, they want to say say i love lasagna well there you go <laughs> it, and they paid several super chats for it so I, I told you i would sneak it in there you go <laughs> one of the last times that i did something like this they tricked me so that's why I'm a little leery. I don't want to say it if it's like if it's an inside like joke or something or like a you know a slang or something. <sighs> if it I is, I don't know. Oh, like, yeah. Declue thinks it's uh, I said Declue's views thinks it's a, a carbonari joke, which is funny. Which is funny. Oh, yeah. Well, in that case, I, I'll be like, yeah. Part two. Part two is going to be entirely on lasagna. We're not going to do the book anymore. <laughs> well, then okay, all right, I can. I'll oblige. Hey, but look, just real quick. So on part two, so that you get hyped for the next time, we still have to cover Fatima. We've got to cover Belladad. We've got to cover liturgy. And now that i got time to prep, you're going to get a lot of stuff on liturgy. We've got to cover modernism. I already covered it in the modernism episode. We'll cover it again. You could do that. We're going to do Vatican II. Uh, we're going to do sexual abuse in the church. I did a lot of research on that. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and we're going to cover uh, what I call the papacy, the church, and uh, the the world before and after the council, which is going to be on his, so he's got a political and sociological view about the world, and I, I'd like to talk about it. It's uh, and uh, I, it'll be fun. I, I mean, I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, I think we just, can. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm hoping to reveal some some uh, you know firsthand stuff. Give you guys exclusive when it comes to Bella Dodd and maybe some of the Fathom stuff too. So it's also, kind, of a little, kind of a little tease for the for for the next one. Also, and I want to be real clear, I'm not. You know, uh, me and Kevin, Kevin is, you know, we're, and Michael, we're all don't like the crisis. Okay. So nobody's saying, look, when I say the Freemasons aren't what he says, that doesn't mean no Freemasons are great. Don't be a Freemason. 
Don't be a Freemason. <laughs> I just, just in case anybody, because people get confused. Well, it's sad that you actually have to say that just I, because I, you don't buy into some of these uh, statements doesn't no. mean you then affirm something else. And no, I it's sad like, that people like, can't this, make that distinction. This is political thing, and I want to be very clear because I this I have a moral point, so I'll give you more. Like I don't want people to go, oh, River said this and he's right, so therefore I could be a Freemason. You can't be a Freemason. Freemasonry is bad. The Enlightenment, at least a large portion of it, was bad. The liberalization of the state and the taking over of the papal states was bad. Uh, yeah. The the um, you know the stuff La Salette's talking about to the extent it's valid is bad, and she and the prophecies right. You know uh, you know you know uh, Taylor Marshall it, like the stuff the stuff that he thinks is bad that's legitimately bad is really legitimately bad because it's legitimately bad. It just because he's wrong on other stuff doesn't mean everything he says is wrong, et cetera, et cetera. It has to be common sense. I'm yeah. on I'm on that team, but anything my team listen, I'm on this team, but my team has to be executing good plays to make a touchdown. If my team is on the sidelines, fiddling around, uh, you know, talking to the audience and eating hot dogs, we're not going to win the game. That's that's what I'm talking about. I'm not about pretending that everything's great. That's yeah, it's, yeah. And it's sad that you actually have to say that. I, I, I noticed this tendency where people fail to make distinctions and they jump to conclusions and it, it's it's just sloppy thinking. I mean, a perfect example is earlier today, I critiqued a bad argument that was used to critique communion on the hand. And People took that to mean, oh, so you're in favor of communion on the hand over communion on the tongue, which uh, technically, actually, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm more in favor of communion on the tongue than on the hand. But it doesn't logically follow just because I critique a bad argument against communion on the hand uh, that I am in favor of having communion on the hand. Oh, over. Michael, you want our <laughs> Lord's body in the carpets. and uh, Yeah, so it doesn't logically follow. And I think that this was actually one of the most helpful uh, undergrad classes that I had was the uh, one of the classes that I had on logic. And, and they actually give you the ability to break down arguments and see okay well this doesn't necessarily follow and you know they they teach you how to think and i think that a lot of people didn't get that class i don't know so yeah and, and, and I, I i certainly am not saying that all those peachy keen moonlight and roses right now in the catholic church i have you know and, and i want to be I used to be, I used to be in seminary and i, I i'm telling y'all right now i've i've front line and center seen the, the, the nonsense and just now saying this has put me in some danger but I say this, you know, it's true. There is a lot of evil going on, but it's not necessarily because of the alta vendita. And that's what we're trying to say. And and I and I know that Kevin agrees with me on this. We we hung out. We had a we had a great breakfast one morning over at my parish. He was in town. Uh, and I, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, Michael would agree to a certain extent. We both agree that there's something like infiltration in the sense of hey, some bad guys get in the church and do stuff. Yeah, duh. Duh, that happened from time. But that's not the, the, the Taylor Marshall's thesis is not there's bad guys in the church and they get influenced sometimes. That's been happening since the first century. Yeah. Taylor's Marshall's thesis is that there's a plot from like 1850 to 2020 that has been contiguous and has been carried out uh, as a systematic, uh, you know, uh, introduction of, of people into the institution to cause a certain result. That's not he. he that's, that's not he didn't, he didn't get there. So that's that's the problem. We how do we get from A to B? Uh, I don't think we did. That's the way it would be very clear. And thank you for the super chat there, Hound, uh, Hound of Heaven. I, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, let, let's go ahead and end it there. Um, Kevin, did you have any plug that you wanted to put in for any of your material? Oh yeah, if if, if you did that, sure. <laughs> Sure, um, go ahead. My first book is Refractions of Light, 201 Answers on Apparitions, Visions in the Catholic Church. Um, the second one I kind of already talked about was Pope Leo the 13th and the Prayer to St. Michael. Um, and then the third one is my book on the third part of Secret of Fatima. Warning, this is not a beginner's book. You, It does presume some basic 
stuff about Fatima and some of the conspiracies and stuff. And you just kind of go from there. I provide like basic explanations. So just warrant a heads up on that. But it has original information. This is the original research kind of stuff that I'm talking about with when I critiqued Marshall earlier. I, I went back and I put some, like, if you want certain information about Fatima and its history, you can only come here. This is the only place you're going to find it at this time, pub at least published information. So uh, that's uh, that's kind of you know important for us to to have is that original research. So I give that not as a plug, but as an example of what I meant earlier. But but yeah, so those are, those are my books, and uh, hopefully more to come. <laughs> River, do you have a plug you wanted to put in? Um, yeah. So uh, I, he's been getting on to me about this over and over, and I'll I'll go ahead. So my friend um, who did the 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 Schielebeck translation. Um, last time he's got a he's got a, a an open letter to I think he's it's a Dutch bishop. He's got an open letter to a Dutch bishop. It's a bishop Bonnie, I think. Um, I'll put it in the voice chat right now. Uh, there it goes, and um, it's uh, it's 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 so this bishop held certain uh, liberal opinions. He holds certain opinions about what happened in the synod on the family, and none of them are true. And he's trying to address it, and he's trying to help out the uh the 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 public situation uh in the continental church that he's dealing with so i'll put it in there and i'll probably put it in some comments later but you know go there and help him out and sign his petition excellent gentlemen thank y'all for coming on it was truly an honor and i'm gonna have y'all back on we'll discuss off the air uh some dates and times where we can have a part two definitely looking forward to it everybody i appreciate the comments the interaction uh, of course don't forget to you know, comment whenever this posts, let me know your thoughts, share this on your social media. Also subscribe. If you haven't already hit the bell for notification, all that good stuff. Uh, but yeah, share this on your social media. If you don't mind, please on your Twitter, your Facebook, help spread the word about what we're doing here with reason and theology. And also check us out. Patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you want to support us and also get access to extra content. All right, that'll do it. God bless. Have a great night.